to start recording this workshop now. Um, this will be posted on the City of Oceanside's website on greenoceanside.org afterwards. So if you have to step away from the computer or end early, this will be available online. Um, you can come back and check it out there. My name is Sarah Davis and I am the city's um, environmental uh, person who's in charge of conservation. So thank you all for coming and we really appreciate it. It looks about like most of you have attended this workshop before. We're actually, we're about split half and half. So welcome to the new people and thank you for the ones that have continued to participate. Um, a brief summary or introduction for Steve. Steve Sherman is a principal and owner of the California Landscape Technologies, a landscape architect firm providing design and consultation services to residential, commercial, and HOA clients since 1992. California Landscape Technologies has specialized in providing landscape architecture services throughout San Diego County and Southern California. Steve utilizes a comprehensive approach to landscape water management that integrates planting considerations in addition to the latest in water conservation practices and technology. Steve currently provides lectures on a variety of landscape related water conservation topics. So we are very excited to um, have Steve here today and I'm going to have him start and share his screen. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Sherman, and as uh, I'd like to thank Sarah for hosting today and all the great work that City of Oceanside really puts a lot of, uh, of great work and, and um, into conservation and all these education programs. And it's great that many of you are taking advantage of that. I really appreciate it. Um, this is my first webinar as an instructor and co-host, so I hope you'll bear with me as I click things and make mistakes and everything else while we're here. Um, I decided to host this uh, session in my garden, and uh, so just consider it uh, ASMR when the hummingbirds fly around behind me um to my feeder but um hopefully it's a little more enjoyable than looking at my otherwise sterile office um at any rate let me end the polling here and go to this and i want to do share screen huh okay We'll do this from the beginning. Okay, so um, hopefully you're all looking at the Water Smart Landscape Makeover Program. If for any reason there's a glitch and I'm looking at something that you're not seeing, please let uh, Sarah know. Uh, type it in the comments and um, she'll get a hold of me and make sure that we'll get this up and running properly. Um, it's great that uh, so many of you have taken the uh, Design for Homeowner classes, so hopefully this will just kind of be a refresher course. Um, if you saw um, uh, Michelle teach the class, um, uh, she and I have different focuses, different things we might talk about in a little more detail, so hopefully you'll get more out of it. And um, Sarah, do you want to talk about City of Oceanside? I will. So um, the city of Oceanside is very excited about water conservation and very proactive in reducing the amount of imported water that we have. City Council in 2010 made a conscious effort to set a 50% local water supply goal by 2030. So that means that we will be getting most of our water from right here in Oceanside. So we are doing two big projects for that. One is called Pure Water Oceanside, which is a advanced water purification facility um, that will purify recycled water. We are also increasing the amount of recycled water. So that is that purple pipe water that is used for irrigation throughout the region. So for agriculture uses, 
HOAs, golf courses, so that sort of thing. We also have a lot of conservation and sustainability efforts um, that we are doing and expanding um, communications through mobile and smart technologies like AMI or smart meters. So we are very excited um, to improve our conservation and local supply efforts and thank everybody for joining us today. So let's talk about um, the, the region that we live in. Um, in San Diego County, the San Diego County Water Authority uh, provides, uh, they buy water and they provide it to the 24 member agencies within San Diego County and um, up into Camp Pendleton area uh, or just short of Camp Pendleton area. Um, you can see on the map, it's a considerable area that uh, the Water Authority provides. Um, so they, they get the water uh, from Metropolitan Water District, who then supplies the water to the uh, San Diego County Water Authority, who then provides the water to each of the member agencies. And of course, you're in one of the, uh, one of these regional areas. Um, in, uh, as part of my introduction, one of the uh, uh, contracts that I have is to provide a water use evaluation service for the Livenhain Water District. Um, luckily, it's right near my home. I live in Encinitas. Um, and what we do is uh, the district provides a free service to their homeowners. And we come out and spend about an hour with uh, homeowners. Um, we used to go in homes and look in at the water use in the house and test toilets and do things like that. But uh, given COVID, we're, we're not doing that portion anymore, but we still go and check uh, timers, go through and, and uh, look at the, um, the settings that you have in your controller. We then turn on as many sprinklers as we can, and it's an educational thing. So we want the homeowner to accompany me as we walk around the yard and I show them what um, I'm looking for as far as um, leaks and breaks and how to tune up their system. And the reason I mention this is because, um, and uh, Sarah can uh, chime in on this as well, but um, um, this service is provided by, I believe, every single water agency. And again, it's a free service. So, um, you know, if you're thinking about improving your yard or you just, uh, your water use has, has suddenly spiked or um, any, any other reason really, um, go ahead and call Sarah and she'll get you scheduled. Is that correct, Sarah? You guys provide that service? Yes, the city of Oceanside does as well. Um, so you can find that on our website at greenoceanside.org or you can send us an email um, and we can get you set up to have someone come and check out your, your area. Thanks, Steve. Great. So um, coming back to um, you know the, our region, um, we have a lot of people that live in San Diego County and um, you know, as it gets out into the, the, the reaches of the east, um, it gets a little sparser but, um, um, and densest on the coast, but um, we, we provide a lot of water to a lot of people. And if you can imagine, excuse me, that um, uh, if everybody had lawns, it would be a considerable amount of water. So we get our water, we get 20% of our water from the Bay Delta area up in Northern California. So that water travels down the California aqueduct. Um, that's a big, one of the uh, major costs of our water. And it's actually not the, um, the, the water itself is not the real cost. The cost is moving the water. Because as you can imagine, when, the, uh, when that uh, snaky um, uh, canal there um, uh, runs into a mountain, they're going to pump it over the top of that mountain. So it's the SDG&E costs and the PG&E costs that um, drive up the, that are actually the biggest component in our water costs. But here in San Diego County, we get 64% of our water from the Colorado River. They still have to pump that. Um, and then we now have a 16% local supply. Um, Carlsbad's desalination, um, Olivenhain has uh, water collection areas. Um, so we get, we're, we're trying to increase that local supply as much as physically possible to try to reduce our dependence on, on uh, getting water from other areas in the state. 
And ultimately, all this water comes from the mountains, right? So um, it comes in snowpack. So when you hear the uh, news uh, talking about the snowpack, you want to pay real good attention whether they think we have a high snowpack or a low snowpack. Even with all the rain that we um, had gotten this uh, last uh, um, winter, um, there wasn't actually a lot of snow up in the mountains, and I believe we're still a little short on snow. So if we can compare, if we can look way back in time um, and compare what, what it was like in 1990, about when I started my business here, um, to where we are in 2017, and one of these days we'll update that to 2020. Um, our population has increased uh, by 38%. Our jobs have nearly doubled. Our gross uh, domestic product has, has, has in fact doubled. And if we look at the potable water use, which is you and me drinking water and um, uh, watering our, our gardens, we've actually decreased our consumption by nearly 30% and per capita nearly by 50%. So what that means is that everyone in, in Southern California has done just a, an amazing job of conserving and um, cutting back on water. Um, on, you know, wa especially water waste. Um, you know, we want people to use water. I tell people, go ahead and flush your toilets. Don't, you know, because when I grew up, the, the toilets had like seven to nine gallons per flush. And what are they now? They're about a gallon and a half, maybe even a gallon of water per flush. So, um, you know, it was technology uh, driven. Um, toilet water is, is, a, is a huge um, thing um, in consumption. Um, and all our faucets all have fixtures that uh, reduce the amount of water that comes out of the actual fixture while still trying to maintain good pr water pressure. So, Landscape is a huge component in the amount of water people use. Often it's about 50% of your, of your use, depending on the size of your property and, and the kinds of plants and things you have there. Um, this photo on the left, the zero scape, that looks exactly like uh, where I was uh, started my profession in Phoenix, Arizona. You had people, you know, that was, that was the desert garden, right? Um, the, the word actually came from Xeriscape, X-E-R-I, scape, and it never really intended to be zero. It was always intended to be more native plants, plants that can use water that's, that's naturally provided by rainfall or that have um, and, and some ideas on, on how to conserve water in the landscape using mulch, um, picking good plant material, zoning your irrigation, all those kinds of things. So, you know, when I talk about, when we first started talking about xeriscaping, um, you couldn't get anyone to take out their lawn back in the 90s. But now, my, uh, the uh, majority of my business is people converting their lawns to gardens like that on the right-hand side. Um, we can have very colorful, easy to maintain and low water gardens. Um, and, and we're not telling people to, to not have a lawn. If you have children, if you have dogs, um, it's just try to limit the lawn to areas where it's most useful and convert those areas of the yard that, that really aren't used for play or, or for appearance um, to a different type of landscape. So we're gonna use this home here as an example um, we have a front lawn that's um, all along the parkway. So when I guarantee that when the sprinklers come on right there, um, they, they spray over sprays into the street and onto the sidewalk. Um, again, it's not really a useful garden space. Um, the one component that I thought was interesting about this is they actually have a garden wall and this great little um, entry court, um, feature with the roof on it. Um, that's actually part of the front yard and that creates a courtyard in the front of the house that's a little more private from the, from the street. 
Um, so they already have a, a great component that, that improves this yard, but they still have all this lawn. All the large plants are pushed up against the wall. Um, so they hired a, a de designer landscape architect to help them and they replanted the space. So this is what it looks like when it's brand new planted. And this is the point where the client tells me or asks me, where did all my money go? Because there's big spaces between all these plant materials and you know they don't really see um, how it's gonna look in the future. But in six months, it begins to fill in and in a year of good care, uh, fertilizations, mulching, uh, weeding, um, this garden's beginning to really come into its own. Um, note the big boulders that um, really make great architectural features at the front of the house and add a lot of interest. And then two years later, the plant materials really come into itself. So here we have Daimondia in the foreground. We have um, in front of the boulder, that's called Othana, O-T-H-A, uh, or oh, I'm sorry, O-T-H-O-N-A. Um, it's a beautiful little succulent plant. Um, we've got some yucca, um, sages, uh, other succulent plant materials. And I also want to point out that as you look at this garden, you see how it the view ramps up from the front. So when you're standing at the sidewalk, you don't have tall plant material blocking the sidewalk or blocking your view towards the house. The taller plants are in the back and the mid-sized plants are in the middle and the lowest plants make a nice border along the sidewalk there. But it's really a beautiful garden. And this is using probably, oh, 50% to 70% less water than the lawn was using. Here's some additional pictures. The yellow flowered plant is the Othana. So the makeover program is this great uh, uh, program that was uh, put together by San Diego County Water Authority and all the member agencies um, helped out. Um, I've been a part of the design process and putting the program together and have been lecturing for some time. Um, there's all sorts of resources that are available online. You can get full copies of, those, of the uh, slides that we're using. Um, there are videos on specific topics. Um, so you can find out more information about that. And there are some things that uh, we're gonna talk about today that I'm gonna only have time to really briefly uh, talk about. So um, go online. And you can find, again, specific topics, plant selection, uh, design, uh, how to design, um, uh, different workshops that you can sign up for, and please do take advantage of all these services. And here's a picture of the, uh, the website. And again, uh, you can like so sign up. Uh, this is a three hour version of the four class series. So um, one thing I like to point out is that, um, uh, you know, it took me five years of, uh, uh, it was a five year program to graduate as a landscape architect. Um, you're not gonna get that in three hours, nor will you get that in a four class series. So, um, but you're gonna get highlights of all those ideas and information on where to look up additional information um, to see if you can design your own gardens and solve uh, some of your own irrigation issues. So we're doing a three hour tour today. Um, one of the things we're gonna go over is uh, looking at trying to use uh, stormwater or the native natural rainfall as a resource for providing some water in our yards. Um, we're gonna talk about irrigation systems. We're gonna talk about design and at the very end, we'll talk about irrigation scheduling. We're gonna go through about an hour and a half and then we'll take a break. Um, and then uh, we'll continue on with the rest of the session. And I believe we're gonna do um, questions maybe at one third and two thirds areas. Um, Sarah, is that um, what you're typically doing or do you do it at the half? Yeah, that sounds good. When there's a good break for you, we can uh 
pull some questions and go from there. So I'll, I'll take your cue. Okay, yeah. So I think we'll do them at uh, one third, two thirds, kind of as we go along. And uh, that way we can catch some questions early. Okay, so again, our workshop is here to try to help you uh, put together ideas for your landscapes. Um, a lot of the, you know, while I might, might mention some specific plant materials, we're really not going into all the specifics, um, but we will be talking about them and we will be providing where these resources are to find those things. So um, the interesting thing about this lecture is normally I'm in a room of 30 to 50 people and I can ask questions of the audience. Um, and rather than do that, we're just going to move ahead and kind of cover these things. But most people here are here to either conserve water or to lower their water bill. Many people will have specific questions about their irrigation system. Uh, my caveat there is that often people have really specific questions that can't be answered without somebody standing in their yard looking at whatever it is that is troubling them. <laughs> Um, so that's, a, that's when you call up the district and ask them to have a water conservation um, uh, expert come to the home and uh, give you a little walkthrough. And if you can make a list of your questions, we can often talk about, uh, you know, whatever specific issues you have. Um, we do want to make sure we have time to go through your entire irrigation system or as much of it as possible. Um, we're going to talk about uh, irrigation retrofit tips. Our goal is to allow you to try to reconform your existing irrigation to use as much of your existing irrigation system as possible to, um, to re-irrigate your, your yard. So for example, um, you know, converting spray heads in a lawn to a drip system. Um, it, you know, in that particular case, we want to use all the pipe in the yard. Um, but, um, you know, we're going to figure out ways of, of converting the sprinkler heads to drip system. Um, we're going to talk about creating an irrigation schedule and how to water in your yard. And we're going to also talk about the reasons uh, for setting these schedules the way we recommend. Um, and then we'll talk about resources at the very end. So if we look at California and we look at Southern, well, specifically San Diego County uh, area, um, there are really s different regions. Um, I'm sitting here at the coast. It's a little bit warm. Or, well, actually, it's really beautiful right now, but it's a little bit humid. And that humidity means that I don't have to water as frequently as folks out in Poway or Escondido or all the way up in the, the foothills in Alpine. Um, and if you look at the chart in the lower left-hand side, you can see that um, how much water is required essentially to water a lawn in each month, okay? So those are the total inches required to water a lawn in each month for every square foot of your lawn. And if we look at June and July, you see the highest requirement of water for the lawn. So in June, well, in June it's perfect, so it's 4.5 inches. Um, so that's one and you know a quarter inches every week over every square foot of my lawn. Okay, and at the end of the year, I've watered 32 or 36 inches of water. Um, over every square foot of my lawn. That is a lot of water. Um, most plant material can use about 40 to 50 percent of that total. So converting lawn to anything is never a zero-sum game. You're always going to have to water something um, if you're putting new plants in, but you can cut that water demand by 40 to 50 percent planting just about any kind of plant material. And if it's native plant material, you can reduce that even more. So here's a, a, um, a bar graph that just kind of shows what I was talking about. So 47 inches, that's actually more like Escondido um, rather than here on the coast. 
Um, 47 inches of water required over the year to keep my grass nice and green. So in San Diego County, uh, when I started this, we used to get about mm, 13, 14 inches of rainfall on average. And uh, lately, uh, because it's averaged over a 10 year span of time, um, that average has actually gone down to 10 inches of, of rainfall. That means that I need to provide 37 inches of water during the year to make up for that uh, shortfall. The other thing that happens here in San Diego is that um, when do we get the, is to just take into account when we get the rain and it's the winter time when the plant material and lawns really don't need it as much. Days are short, nights are cool, plant material just doesn't require as much water. So, um, you know, the biggest demand is going to be in the summer months. And one thing I also want to point out, whoops, is if you look at these, um, these, this graph or down at the bottom of the chart, um, in November, it's saying that I only need an inch and a half of water or an inch and a quarter of water in that month. Um, and you'll think, geez, when's the hottest month? Well, plant material doesn't think the same way we do. Um, because of the shorter days and cooler nights, the plant material uses less water. So you really want to start shutting your schedule down, watering the most in July, June, July, August, and then begin backing it off by 30% in September, October, and then almost watering a summer schedule in November, December. Now, if you're getting a Santa Ana condition, you're gonna turn it on for as much as you need to just during that week, and then go back to your normal schedule. And what does 40 inches of rainfall look like? Well, this looks like where I went to college, which is Eugene, Oregon. And you can see that uh, the moss is uh, doing very, very well there. Um, the lawn's looking great. Um, they actually make sod in, uh, in Oregon, in Eugene. Um, it's one of the biggest business there. And um, um, we can see that uh, 40 inches of rainfall is, um, you know, it was, it was interesting going to school there, so, you know, riding your bike in the, in the rain most of the days. So San Diego is in what we're calling a Mediterranean climate. And the reason we say that is because we have very similar climate to the Mediterranean region. Um, and there's a corresponding region in the Southern hemisphere, um, parts of Chile, South Africa, and Australia, where we have very similar conditions, which is um, a little bit of rainfall in the winter time and then warm and um, but not you know overly too hot uh, for most of the year um, the interesting thing about that is that if you go to um, the nurseries and look up the names of the plant materials that we use here um, often you'll find that uh, the majority of plant materials were especially succulents and um, uh, were grown in chile and uh, were native to south africa or Australia, eucalyptus, for example. And here's that curve again. So if you look at the, what we call the evapotranspiration, which is a, a scientific term for evaporation of the water from the air, uh, from, you know, from heat in the sun and transpiration of the plant material, we find a water requirement for these plant materials and you can see that um, uh, moderate to low plant materials use 60% 60 60 less water than turf. And you can see the peak in the turf in the middle of the, um, the season and then going down uh, uh, in the winter time. Um, native plants get all their water from the natural rainfall. And they therefore require more water in winter time. And you can see these peaks kind of climbing on the, in November, December, um, as opposed to most of our other plants. Okay, so 
Um, the most ornamental plants will use more water and they will actually use more water in spring and summertime. And native plants really don't want to be watered. In fact, you can kill them very quickly by watering in uh, summertime. Um, if you're thinking about using 100% native plant material, um, I recommend you join a native plant society. There's a wonderful uh, group in, in uh, Balboa Park. They're probably doing seminars online right now like we're doing now. Um, but um, um, they're super good on resources and they can really put you straight on how to care for your native plants. Native plants are unlike our, you know, the majority of, of plants that we get at the nursery. So um, you really want to know what you're doing there. And if you hire a gardener to plant your plants, um, you want to make sure that they're, uh, they have a background in native plant material as well. Uh, because of the water requirements and the, um, uh, for example, you don't fertilize um, or put in as much organic amendment for native plants. So regional perspective. So if you really want to save water, we want to identify areas in our garden that we can use a little less water. Um, one of the biggest concepts of xeriscaping is that the areas right around the house, your highest uh, areas of use, um, you budget a little more water use. You might have annuals, you might have succulents that require a little more water, but those are kept tight to the house. And as you move away from the house to the borders of the yard or the back 40, if you've got a larger property, um, you want to specify plant materials that, that uh, use a lot less water and actually require much less maintenance. Um, so that's one of the, the, uh, the nine principles of Xeriscape Garden, and I recommend you look it up on the, on the web and um, check that out. Um, so if you're trying to convert your existing garden, um, especially if you're going to introduce a lot of new plant materials, then you really want to look at your irrigation system and see if there's ways that we can convert it to a more efficient system. Many of the systems that I see when I go out to gardens are, uh, were installed in the 80s or 90s, and people haven't upgraded them at all since then. So um, many of them are worn out and just need to be refreshed. Um, but there's also new technology out there for making things more efficient. We're gonna talk about that in a second. Um, and that's what we're here for is to educate you. So when you're looking at your garden, and you're thinking about replanting in particular and not just converting your irrigation system, but actually thinking about uh, using new plant materials and such. Um, there's a kind of handy way to look at um, irrigation efficiency and plant selection. Um, uh, this system gives you the most stars if you have the least uh, water, the lowest water requirement, the plant materials don't need as much water, and you're using the highest efficiency of irrigation. Most people are going to fall into the two star, one and a half star range. Um, we're still trying to select low water use plant materials, but we want to try to get the best um, irrigation system as possible. Um, that'll still allow you a lot of color and um, Essentially, three stars is a native planting. Um, so, you know, most people want a little more ornamental planting than uh, a lot of the native plants. And don't get me wrong, like native plants can look quite beautiful, but there isn't as big a selection to uh, pick from. So when we talk about irrigation efficiency, um, on the left-hand side, you see a low efficiency and the reason is those are traditional spray heads and they have a very high precipitation rate. Um, they're the conventional sprays and I will tell people, you know, you don't actually have to change all the nozzles, but you could improve your efficiency greatly if you did. Um, you want to make sure you don't have cracked and broken nozzles, of course, and that the heads are popping up above the lawn. But um, um, otherwise, um, you know, the spray heads can be used. You just need to know that after only two or three minutes, you may be getting a lot of runoff. And in the picture on the left, you can also see that those heads are misting 
and that's from too high a pressure, that water is not staying in that uh, space. That water is just blowing off in, in the slightest breeze and uh, going to the neighbor's house. Um, medium efficiency um, is the use of uh, still using overhead spray. Anything that you spray from the overhead is going to have some evaporation as it transfers. Um, it can also be blocked by the plant material. Um, so that's why we consider it a medium, although they are pretty efficient. Um, I prefer uh, rotating nozzles and large rotors over drip in some applications. Um, mainly where I have really wide beds and it's difficult to get to the middle of the bed um, if you're looking at, uh, you know, trying to maintain a drip system. Um, certainly on large slopes, the overhead irrigation is a much better system. I can see when the heads are blocked or broken. If I have drip on a slope, I really can't tell what's going on until there's a huge pile of, uh, you know, puddle of water in my, at the bottom of the hill. And then I have to look through the plant material to try to find where that drip leak is. So I do prefer the uh, rotating nozzles um, on most uh, systems. On the right, you can see at the top, that's actually probably a drip system for a lawn, um, given the large area that they're, they're implying it. And that's a really, this is called inline drip tube. And it has drippers glued and manufactured inside the tube. Um, so that every single outlet is giving exactly one gallon in an hour, for example. You can get different size drippers. But um, if you imagine that that's a lawn, you want every square foot of that watered um, because the roots are everywhere. That's no different than if you have a shrub bed where you have roots throughout the shrub bed. Every square inch is covered with roots. And if you put in a drip system where you only have one outlet and then several feet before the next outlet, um, and often I see this, um, oh, the breeze is coming up and I may lose all my little uh, shelter here, but <laughs> we'll hope for the best. Um, at any rate, um, uh, so you want to think about when, whenever you're irrigating a space, you want to think about where the roots are going to be. I often go to homes and see um, little spider bubblers put at the base of the plant. And the problem with that is that it's only watering the stem of the plant and it's not watering the full root zone. So my preference is to install inline drip tube whenever possible. Um, down at the bottom, you can see a bubbler. Bubblers are very specific. Usually I only see bubblers used for um, uh, roses and uh, citrus trees. Um, they work very well if you have a basin. If you try to bubble on a slope, that's not a good idea. It's just going to run off down the hill. Um, one comment I do like to make about bubblers is that choose a fixed precipitation rate bubbler. An adjustable bubbler is a problem because I'll look at six different roses and I can't tell you if they're all getting the same amount of water. One could be getting a gallon a minute another five gallons a minute. If they're all the same roses, they should all be getting the same amount of water. And you can um, go down to one of your supply stores and find fixed gallon bubblers so that I know that when I run it for three minutes, I'm getting exactly one gallon per minute or three gallons for every single plant. And then we look at plant selection. On the left, we have a much more drier look um, with uh, uh, several types of agaves, uh, DG or granite um, areas, um, and then some ground cover areas. So it might be that the plant material up above on the left in the center actually um, may need zero water other than the rainfall it gets but the ground cover on the right hand side may need some sprinkler water because it's covering more ground and there's more root. Um, Mediterranean plants are shown in the, the uh, center. Medium plants, a little more um, 
water requiring. Um, I can't really make out the plant material in that picture. I'm sorry, but um, um, agapanthus and some of the Indian hawthorns and, and you know, shrubs like that, pittosporums, um, require a little more water than some of the more uh, drought tolerant Mediterranean plants. And then try to cut down on your lawn. Often I go to places and I suggest to the client, you know, if you just cut five feet off the, you know, off the edge where your shrub bed is and move, move the sprinklers closer into the lawn, you won't even notice that it, it's gone. Um, and yet you've, you've reduced your uh, water requirement, the planting area by, you know, 10, 20 percent. Um, there may be areas where you've got little slivers of lawn that are really hard to irrigate. Um, those are good ideas for conversion to some other plant material. And you may have a garden, um, you know, where you want a water feature or, um, or again, right around the patio or around the pool where you actually have a larger, um, you know, you've got uh, more activity and you use more water for the plant materials. And that's perfectly acceptable. You just want to limit those areas. So how do you go about designing your garden? Well, the first thing I always do is, um, you know, if somebody hires me is I'm going to draw a plot plan and um, so that I can accurately place the plant material. If I don't understand how wide the beds are, it's difficult for me to pick plant materials. Um, and when you're picking plant materials, you wanna make sure that you understand what variety you have and how big that plant gets. Um, things like bougainvillea and lantana, they may get, get uh, eight to 10 feet across. And if you plant that in a bed that's only three or four feet wide, um, what happens is you're having to hedge that all the time. And that might be the look you're looking for, but that's typically not the look that I'm looking for. So you wanna choose your plants based on the size of the beds and you wanna understand how big the beds are uh, to lay out your plan. So get your tape measure and um, a piece of grid paper and measure out and draw out your, your plan. Um, you can use different scale grid paper. And if you go down to uh, the, um, the uh, office supply stores, um, you can typically find a transparent vellum paper um, that has uh, grids on it that are either a quarter or an eighth or a, or a tenth in dimension. And you can draw your plan pretty simply after you measured it. You can just count the grids and um, uh, know how big it is. Um, plus it helps you with uh, drafting straight lines. Um, you want to be sure to add a legend because you may do some other things. Typically what I'll do is I'll draw that picture in the bottom and I call that my base and I'll write save on that, um, the plot plan. And then I can take pieces of additional tracing paper and lay it over the top and draw some ideas. And oops, I don't like that idea. I'm going to throw that away and I'll put another piece of tracing paper. And I don't have to redraw the whole thing because I'm tracing over the plot plan that's taped down to my desk. So that's a great way of, of doing lots of design ideas. You can kind of lay it out, then take the plan out to the yard, use a hose to kind of lay out where the beds are or something like that. You can get some little flags or somehow mark where the plants will go. You can even take lawn furniture out and kind of lay it where you might have a patio and look at live in the space for the weekend and then go back to the drawing board and say, well, I need more room over here and I need more room over there. We'll talk about that a little more uh, in a second. So part of site analysis is to understand, um, you know, what your soils are like and where the water is going on the property and where you have shade. And um, when we talk about soils, um, soils are making it made up of various components. Um, and the, the three primaries are sand, silt, and clay. If you have a very sandy soil, 
water will not be retained in the soil. It will wash, it'll just run right through the bottom. That means that to maintain your plant material, you're gonna have to water much more frequently, not more, just more frequently. The other thing about sandy soils is that they have zero nutrient holding capability. So we wanna improve that with using mulch and compost to improve the soil. The good thing about it is that the water moves through it quickly. So a lot of plant materials can um, really survive and, and enjoy themselves uh, in that uh, sandy soil. But it doesn't hold on to that water. So we have to make sure that we're watering a much more frequent schedule. A silty soil is kind of a medium component. Um, the, uh, the size of the silt is certainly smaller than sand, glues together. And it has a, lot, a really good nutrient holding uh, capability um, and a water holding capability. Clay soils, and I'm gonna hold up a sample here from my slope. I don't know if you have an image of me. So this rock is essentially a clay soil and I can crack it in half and I have this underneath my sandstone. So to improve my soils, I need to keep in mind that water is not moving through all of my soils. It's hitting those clay layers and sitting there. Um, it may be running off and daylighting at the bottom of the slope. Um, often after the rains, people call me and say, oh, well, my neighbor's overwatering because I'm seeing all this water and it's really just groundwater from, from the last rains. But to improve clays, we wanna use things like uh, gypsum and organic amendments. Now, the interesting thing about clay is that um, it doesn't wanna get wet first. The water just kind of runs off and beads off because it's so tight and there's very little oxygen and nothing in clay soils. Um, but once it gets wet, it stays wet for a very long time and it holds on to that water jealously. The plant material has trouble pulling the water out of that type of soil. So the ideal soil is what we call loam. And that's a really nice mixture of all the particle types. It has a little clay, a little um, uh, silt, and a little sand. So there's drainage, there's nutrient holding capability, and it will hold on to water for at least a little while um, while we're watering so we don't have to water every single day. Um, and that's another thing to just consider is, is on clay soils, uh, you may water, get the soil wet, and you may not have to water but once a week. Um, you wanna keep it moist, but not wet. Um, with sandy soils, you may be watering every single day. With a loam soil, you can get away with watering your shrub beds probably two days a week, and uh, lawns would have to be much more frequent. So how do we determine what kind of soil we have? Well, I recommend that you go in your yard and you dig yourself a 12 by 12 by 12 inch hole. We're gonna use this for a couple things. One is we're gonna uh, use it to determine the type of soil we have. So, um, and this is a fun thing to do with the family. So you take a sample of the soil and you put it in a jar and you, Actually, what you do is you, you fill up the jar about three quarters of the way to the top. And again, I don't know if you can see this, you add just a drop of dishwashing liquid to it to help break up the oils in the soil. And then you add, say, one third of um, the soil from your yard to the bottom of the jar. You shake that up really good. and then you leave it for a few days. And what happens is you'll get this perfect profile of clay, silt, and sand. And you simply look at the percentages of how much sand there is versus the silt and clay, and you can kind of get a, a nice breakdown on where your yard fits on this soil pyramid. Um, this is less, you know, again, clay loam is going to be perfect in 40% in silt and 40% uh, sand 
and a little less, uh, 20% 20, 20 uh, clay. So that's how this uh, chart works, this uh, soil pyramid. But you can get a pretty good picture of it here. The more clay you have, the more you're gonna need to amend your soil to break up the clay. So you're using, again, compost and amendments and uh, things like gypsum uh, to help break down those clays. The more sand you have, you, again, you need more organic amendment um, to try to be able to then retain water on your property in the soil. So that's soil texture. Soil aggregation is when the, um, the soils um, collect together with organic uh, amendment. Um, and and uh, what happens is they, they create a, a, a cracks and crannies in the, in the soils. Um, if you imagine um, a bowl of sugar, um, the individual, you know, uh, kernels of, or uh, grains of, of sugar are kind of like a sandy soil. But if you have a sugar cube, that sugar has aggregated into a cube. And if you look at a jar of sugar cubes, there's big air spaces between that. And that's what you want. You want a really good aggregation so that we have air and water getting between the soil particles. We also wanna look at how much compaction you have. And again, how much clay you may have in your actual soil and whether that's gonna be a hindrance to um, good root growth and, and moisture uh, collection. So now we wanna take that same hole and we're gonna do what's called a percolation test. And this is a measure of how fast the soil drains. So you've already got your hole you wanna fill it up with water and leave it overnight. If you go back out and it's still full of water, you know you have a clay soil. But if it's empty, then what you wanna do is lay a stick over the hole, refill the hole with water, and then wait one hour. And what we wanna do is at the end of the hour, we're gonna uh, measure how far the water level has dropped in infiltration in that hour. Okay, and if we get less than an inch, or like I say, if you, um, it, you know, if you go out and it's still full of water, then we want to, we have a clay soil and we need to add organic amendments and uh, select plant materials that can tolerate those tight clay soils. So if you look up a plant in a Western Garden Book or some other resource, and it tells you that you, that that plant requires good drainage, and you have a clay soil, I would not be choosing that plant material. I would try to pick something that will tolerate um, less than perfect drainage. If it goes down one to three inches in an hour, then you have really pretty perfect soil. Again, that nice loam soil that'll hold on to water long enough for the plant material to, to use it, um, but does dry out and has lots of organics in it. Um, if it drains very quickly, if you just keep pouring water in and the hole never fills up, then you've got a sandy soil. And again, you're gonna add organic amendments um, and you might even uh, create mounds or um, um, other things to try to, to uh, uh, provide areas to collect water in the mulches and amendments that you're gonna add to the soil. So here's those little um, aggregates that we talked about. Um, and we're talking about soil capacity right now, the ability of the, the soil to hold on to water and what that means. And when we're irrigating, what we wanna do is to irrigate, not quite to saturation, but almost. Because once we reach saturation, the water is going out the bottom and beyond the root zone of the plant materials and that's wasted water. So what we wanna do is to water what we call, to what we call field capacity. And it's the amount of water that's held in the soil just before it runs down into the uh, deeper water or deeper soil, but enough to fill it up and leave some air space for the plant for air. 
Um, all plant roots require air. Um, when you, if you've ever seen trees fallen in San Diego, you'll note that they really don't go down very deep. They're um, usually in the first 24 inches of soil. And the reason is because of the air. They need air. If we have sandy soils, there's air down deeper and you may get deeper rooting. Um, and then one thing that we want to pay attention to is we never want to dry out our soil so much that it reaches permanent wilting point. Um, if you've ever let a, left a pot out, a potted plant out in the, uh, in the sun and allowed it to dry out too much, um, at some point the plant will simply, um, it'll wilt off and will not be able to take up any more water and it doesn't matter how much you add, water you add, you may lose that plant material. So we never wanna get to the permanent wilting point. So what we wanna do is when we're planting, we want to water to the field capacity of the soil. This is typically what I tell people to do and is the best practice. This is before you even plant. Water and fill up your entire soil area, all the ground around your plant materials to field capacity. Let it dry out overnight and then go ahead and plant your plants. The reason is if you put the pot in the ground and just fill the pot, the, the, the area where you're planting with water, a dry soil all the way around it will wick that water away and dry out your plants much more quickly. So we want it set to field capacity when we start our planting and when we start our irrigation. And then we wanna let it dry out and you check the moisture over a period of days and when you think that it's just kind of moist, but not uh, completely dry, you want to water again, okay? And that sets your watering schedule. For new plant material, you may be watering either every day in the summer or every other day, for example. Um, but once the plant material is established and the roots are down deep in the ground, you can get away with watering typically two days a week for most shrub beds and most plant material. Okay, so we're gonna talk about watersheds and capturing water. So a watershed is an area of land where all the water in it drains off to a common outlet. And if you look at this picture, you can see the valley, you can see the mountains in the distance. And at some point on the top, very top of the mountain where that little house is on the right, um, if you spill your coffee to the left, it goes into the valley. And if you spill your coffee to the right, um, that ridge line, it goes into a different river valley. And those are called watersheds. And when the water, when it rains, all the water comes down those mountains, down through the valley and collects in the lowest point and runs off to the ocean. And here's a kind of a cool map that shows you the various watersheds. Um, if you look at the San Luis Rey watershed, it's pretty interesting. It starts very wide but as it reaches the ocean, it becomes super narrow where that river um, is all the, you know, the distance across the watershed is pretty much the river itself as it reaches the ocean. And when we have big rainstorms, what do we hear on the news? We hear that you can't swim at the beach. And that's because all the debris, all the dust, all the brake dust, all the, um, the, uh, animal waste that's been fall, you know, that's fallen on the yard, that's fallen in the street, gets washed down to the ocean and concentrated there. And it takes a few days for that to, to uh, dilute. So our goal is to try to capture as much of that water as possible in our property, treat it right on our property. And then when it overflows and goes down towards the river and the ocean, it's much cleaner and we can all do that. Another reason to capture this water in your property is to take advantage of the natural rainfall and try to hold it here instead of letting it run off. So these are great photographs. Michelle took these from her office. And on the first day of rain, you can see all the salts and um, debris collecting in the street. 
And that first inch of rainfall gives us what we call the first flush. All the dust and debris on your roof, on your sidewalks, around your yard gets washed off. And after that first inch and a subsequent storm event, you get more rain, but you don't see any of that uh, salt and uh, foaming that's happening on the left-hand side. And that's because it's already first, the fl first flush is already over. So what we want to try to do is to, to clean that first flush. And the ideal way to do that is to run it through a pond or a, um, a capture area with plant material in it. And that plant material filters off those materials. Um, and then the water can run off clean. Now there's various ways to capture that water and use it in your property. Um, most people know about rain barrels, but there are some other solutions. All this is called LID or low impact development. And I'm gonna talk about some um, calculations here and what I recommend, we, you know, we don't have a lot of time to, um, to really go into it in detail. So, um, I'm going to um, refer you to uh, the web pages, and uh, which we'll talk about at the very end, um, and you'll find out more information about how to calculate and how to design for that. There's actually a great book that's online, and it's essentially this uh, this um, document, and it's the Sustainable Landscape Guidelines, and I believe it's online. So with your map that you made of your house and using a Google map, uh, oops, a Google map of your roof, you can determine where all the water is collecting. Now, one thing I like to do is to um, actually uh, go out during a rainstorm and look around my property and see where is the water collecting. Um, if I'm sitting in my house and just kind of looking out the window, I can't really see that. So you know, put your flip-flops on, put your shorts on, put a rain jacket on, and go out and kind of look where all this water, water is going. And in this particular example, you can see all the water collecting around the house where the, um, where the water uh, is coming down the roof drains. Well, that's not a good thing. Um, if you keep your foundation wet, if you've got any kind of wood floors, um, uh, stucco, um, all those kinds of things can remain wet get moldy and deteriorate and that's, that's all you know all bad things so what we want to try to do is get that water away from the house we can also see that water is pooling down at the sidewalk typically our properties are designed so that the house is slightly higher than the street so that all water that runs off the property runs towards the street and you used to be able to put this into a drain and cut a hole in the curb and run it out to the street. That's no longer a legal solution. And now we need to capture the water in our property. Now, if you've already got a storm drain that runs to the street, there's no problem with that. You just can't make new ones. So, you know, again, we're looking at different types of landscape. We've got a really large lawn in the middle picture there that, that pretty much drains straight to the sidewalk, but they do have a, a, a tree at the uh, driveway. Um, in the lower right, we've got kind of a bad situation. We have all that water draining down that slope into uh, essentially running right to the sidewalk, which becomes the stream bed. And hopefully they've got slight drainage away from the house to the sidewalk so that the water uh, collects there um, and then out. Um, and then in the upper picture, we've got a large lawn. Again, the house is set up. Um, they really shouldn't have drainage issues, but they have kind of an intermediate slope um, in the middle of the yard with a flat area at the top and a flat at the bottom. So we're just trying to understand what the yard looks like when we design for it. And again, you can use Google Maps to um, look at your roof and see what the roof line is really doing and then identify where your drains are. Print out a copy of that and, and you can mark it up. And if we go back to this plan, you can see where we've drawn the, sketched the lines onto the roof. And you see quite a lot of water 
concentrates right at the entry of the house. So if I don't have gutters, maybe that's a place I really want to put gutters. So we're evaluating our site. We're looking at the slope, um, measuring you know how many, um, uh, how much drop we have in a specific number of feet. And again, you can uh, use these calculations: um, rise over run, um, the amount of rise, the the height in a certain specific distance will calculate your slope. Five percent slope is very gentle. The water kind of will soak into the ground a little bit more, but a 50% slope or a one, uh, essentially a two to one slope, which is most of our slopes in our backyards, um, the water runs off very quickly. It doesn't have a chance to um, soak into the ground very easily. So you're gonna get a lot more runoff and collection on a, on a two to one slope. Um, we wanna make sure that that's heavily planted so that the water that falls on the slope hits the leaves and, and uh, slows down before it gets to the slope itself. And we have lots of uh, plant material there that those roots are gonna hold that soil in place. Oh, they do make a point here that if you're using DG, you generally want a slope less than 5%. If you try to put uh, de decomposed granite on uh, any kind of steeper slope, it will move downhill, gravel is the same, um, and end up at the bottom of the hill eventually. So if you're going to have uh, DG paths um, and they do go downhill, you may wanna install landscape timbers or some kind of border um, across to intercept the gravel as it's, you know, say every 10 or 15 feet apart um, to kind of hold it in place on a steeper slope. Our goal in low impact development is to eliminate or reduce runoff. And again, we're catching the water on our roof. It's collecting on our paving and our driveways. There's not a lot you can do about the driveway. Um, without uh, saw cutting and, and much more considerable cost. Um, but there are things we can do with walks and paving. Um, gravels and uh, granite and rock um, and uh, flagstone with, that's set on sand is semi-permeable. The areas between the stones, you, can, you know, the water's going in. But landscape areas are the most permeable surfaces, and we want to move the water from the non-permeable surfaces to a permeable open area. We want to get the water away from the foundation of the house. So we don't want our uh, roof drains to be pouring water right at the foundation without that water moving beyond to more than five feet from the foundation of the house. So we wanna create a kind of a map on our plan that um, limits where we collect our water to five feet from the foundation, 10 feet from any other buildings, and three feet from our sidewalks and uh, walls and paving. Um, if you've got expansive clay soils or real problems and issues with poor percolation or just a complicated yard, Again, uh, seek a professional. There's uh, soils engineers, there's uh, engineers, landscape architects, all can provide that service for you and uh, try to help you with the drainage on the property and as well as uh, collecting the water. So in this plan, um, you can see a little blue box that's circled here. And that's, um, I believe, three feet from the property line three feet from our sidewalk and five feet from the house. And that's the limited area that we can use to capture water from this house. Now there are gutters on the right hand side on the far side of the sidewalk. And in that particular case, um, we're probably not gonna be able to capture that water and run it all the way to our drainage basin. But we can capture the water on the left hand side of the house. That's the safe area to hold water until it seeks into our soil sponge or filter or basin. Um, you wanna make sure that you, again, 
don't have clay soils. We don't want water to still be in the after rain event. We would prefer that all the water drains away in at least a day. Um, we don't want to, the goal is not to ever create a lake where it's going to retain for longer periods of time. And with some clay soils and compacted sandstone like I have, that could easily happen if it's not uh, managed properly. So here's a design where they uh, took the water from a down spout and ran it out uh, to kind of a river rock swale and they're capturing the water. They're slowing down the water as it comes down by, by using rocks in the basin and it's capturing the water there and uh, any of the plant material that's in that bay or you know around that area can utilize that water uh, from, the, from the ground. Um, here's a 14 foot long basin, 12 feet wide, and it'll hold uh, 50 cubic feet of water at four inch deep. So that's one kind of basin. Um, here's a river rock swale, okay? Um, in this particular case, they've added an overflow on the right hand side so that rather than the water overtopping the bottom of the swale and eroding, the water goes into that pipe and then goes out to the original curb, curb cut. Um, this seems kind of crazy to me, but you could feasibly cut um, some benches into your slope. Um, I might make it a path that where the level path um, slightly leans to the left into the slope so that the water collects in the, along the path. Um, this is a more uh, extreme example. And here are some great ideas. And, and as you drive around your neighborhoods and take, you know, hopefully you're taking pictures of people's yards, um, you can see that um, um, the you know really nice dry stream beds. Um, the infiltration trench can also be a French drain, um, but in this case they've got gravel on the surface. Um, cisterns they actually make um, uh, products like the um, uh, container at the right that go in the ground and can capture water and have holes in it so that it, the water. Um, um, drains off slowly into the into the ground table. Um, if you go to NDS, um, they're a drain manufacturer and they have a lot of uh, products similar to that. Um, and then of course your rain barrels. Um, rain barrels are great but they take up a lot of space. And for example, um, um, 83 cubic feet of water would require 11 55 gallon can rain barrels, right? So um, that's a lot of rain barrels to capture all that water. Um, however, a first flush from a 1,000 square foot roof of one inch of rain, 83 cubic feet. I think I have that as a, you could capture that in a basin four inch deep that's about 15 by 16 foot in dimension. Okay, you could capture all that water, let it soak into your yard. So you wanna make sure that you, you measure that. And again, these calculations are online. And then we have, um, we're moving into actual design of the yard, okay? so. At first, uh, in the first section, I talked about, you know, making a site plan of what your yard looks like, making sure that you write save on that and use that as the site plan and then lay tracing paper over the top of that to design your spaces. We call this a bubble diagram and it's a great way to just kind of look at how you might lay out various spaces. In this particular design, they're looking at creating maybe a front yard patio a little outdoor room. I love to think of uh, outdoor spaces as rooms. Um, it's because we're gonna create walls, we have floors, we have um, uh, uh, ceilings that are plant, you know, made of trees um, or patio covers. Um, so they really are room spaces. And in this uh, particular example, they um, let's just say that the neighbor has a Winnebago parked on their side of their house and we need a tall plant screen along that edge. 
And then, um, oops, sorry, my neighbor's got his diesel going, so um, hopefully that won't be too uh, disturbing here. Um, they did a bioswale, so they're getting the way, water away from the house, and they're keeping it back from the sidewalk. And then, like we talked about in that first photograph, they're keeping plants very low along the public sidewalk so that you don't feel cramped as you're walking along that sidewalk and you actually get this nice view up to the front of the house. Um, and you can, you know, draw a diagram like this and then, um, you know, toss it, away, toss it out, um, try another, you know, push the patio out towards the front, push the patio to the side. Maybe you decide you don't want a swale. Um, so all those kinds of ideas can be looked at. And I'll often go through reams of uh, tracing paper before I get the design that I like right. So, um, and then the other best thing to do is to take the plans that you like and lay them out in the space. You can do it with chalk. You can do it with uh, gypsum in a, in a coffee can, just kind of paint it out. Um, or you can actually get uh, paint. Um, but I, you know, the, the problem with paint is uh, I can't get rid of it until, you know, I mowed the lawn. Um, but if I use a, a gypsum, I can get a broom and dust it away like a big eraser and then make my outdoor room a little bit bigger um, and then set out some patio furniture and just kind of chest out the space, see what it looks like. Okay, so I'm sorry we didn't take our one third break. We're gonna take a break now. It'll be our halfway through break. Um, so I think we're gonna collect some questions. Um, let's take just uh, five minutes to take a quick break. Does that sound good? And then that uh, sounds good. And, and you can type your questions in and Sarah will collect them for us. And then uh, we'll answer questions in a second. Yeah, we don't have any questions right now. So if you guys have some, um, go ahead and share it in the chat or raise your hand and we can unmute you when you get back. Thanks so much, everybody. is being recorded um, and will be posted on our website www.greenoceanside.org in about a week. Um, we will be sending out a follow-up email after this workshop that will include all the links that Steve's been talking about, the slides, a link to the recording, a survey, all that kind of stuff. So you will get that the same way that you got your login information. So I just wanted to clarify that with everybody. Um, we did have some questions about soil. So they, we had a couple questions about if there was two different kinds of soil in their yard um, and how would they be able to tell? Um, well, so if you really do have, you, you can, do that 12 by 12 by 12 hole dig in as many locations as you feel is required. So if you have a, typically on a single property, you're not gonna have a lot of um, difference between the front and the backyard. But if you have a larger property, and especially a property in the back country um, where they didn't grade the pad, um, you may have different soils on, on that property. And you're just simply doing a soil test wherever you think that it's necessary to check for that. And uh, another question for that was, where would be the best place to dig the 12 by 12 by 12 hole? Uh, it really doesn't matter. Um, but just kind of select the area. You're gonna do it in the area that you're going to replant. So for example, if you're only replanting a front yard, then that's where the hole's gonna go. And, you know, so it could be in the middle of the yard, it really doesn't matter. But it should be in a planting Great. area, a proposed planting area. Um, so there was a question about if there could be anything that could be done about the water hardness in the area. Um, and that's a, just so you know, a question to you. <laughs> <laughs> in general, um, the reason why the water is hard is because it is transported from, like we talked about at the beginning of the of the presentation, from Northern California 
or the Colorado River. So it just gets a lot of material in it through that transportation process. So it's open and so they get silt and sand and salt and all that kind of stuff. Um, some people install water softeners into their house um, to kind of help with that and remove some of that once it comes through. Yeah, you want to make sure that if you're using a salt type of water softener that you're not using that in the garden. Okay, so don't use the hoses to water your um, plants that if they're attached to the house if you've got a, a water softener. If you have an os um, a reverse osmosis system, then you don't have to worry about that as much. Okay, so another question is they have a drip irrigation system that has check valves in the tube at the port. Um, how do they put in bubblers or feed lines? Um, that's a question better left to an expert on your property. I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Okie dokie. Another person said, I have two creeks on both sides of the house as I live in the middle of a valley. What is the best way to capture the continuing water flows and store them to use it during the summer? Um, again, I think it's best if you have somebody come onto your property, a professional, to talk with you about that. Um, you need to be cognizant of the fact if it's an actual native stream, um, you're going to get periods of really high flow. So if you're creating dams or weirs in the property to try to draw off some of that water, which is a great way to kind of capture it and allow it to soak in, um, just look up weir, W-E-I-R, online. Um, it's essentially a dam that has a cut in it so that it uh, breaks, so, you know, the water collects behind the dam and then, and then goes through the cut. Um, but if you have a storm situation, you want to make sure that that doesn't get overflowed and washed out. Um, you can be doing a lot more damage to your property if you're not cognizant of how much uh, storm water may collect on that. So we had a question about setting up um, a better way to water their garden beds. So they have tried DIY drip irrigation um, and they haven't had a lot of help from local landscape companies. So they're just looking for your opinion. Um, if there's a great way to do a garden bed setup and if they're doing drip irrigation, what is the optimal time to water? Currently they are watering nine minutes. Um, well, right now, yeah, so um, it's hard for me to tell you what the time is. And, and again, I would have a, uh, uh, get one of the free consultations from the district uh, to come out to your property and look at how you're watering and they'll be able to tell you what the run times should be. Um, what was the first part of that question? They're trying to see what's the best way to, to water a garden bed. So using like a drip irrigation or something different like that. Oh, well, uh, yeah. And also the, uh, the time frame, right? So, um, uh, right now there's no restriction, but, um, the basic times to water are, uh, 8 PM till 8 AM in the morning. You want to complete all your watering before 8 AM. And the primary reason for that is we don't want sun and wind to be creating um, uh, evaporation, okay? So um, if you're only watering for a few minutes and, and it's in the middle of the day, that water is gonna evaporate before it even gets into the soil. So um, you can either, I mean, essentially any time at night, there have always been questions about like, uh, well, I don't wanna water at night because I'm gonna get fungus on my plant material. Well, being coastal communities, that's going to happen anyways. So we pretty much ignore that unless you're growing plants for like the county fair in a competition, then you want to be very cognizant of how you're watering and when, what time you're watering. Um, you just don't want it to sit on the plant leaves for excessive periods of time. Um, and it depends on your situation. Again, you know, drip systems are very efficient, but I find that they take a lot more maintenance and don't last as long as overhead irrigation systems. But a well-designed overhead irrigation system will work perfectly adequately. Um, you wanna think about where are the roots of the plant? 
a tree that has branches out 30 feet from the trunk, every square foot underneath that tree is roots. So putting one little bubbler at the base of, the, of a mature tree is not going to adequately water that plant material. Great. So we have two more. Um, the next one is they have overhead sprinklers um, because, and they live on a slope and there is a lot of runoff. So is there a type of sprinkler that works better for slopes? Yeah, we're going to talk about that. Um, you can retrofit any spray system to a rotating sprinkler nozzle. They go right on your existing sprinkler head in most cases. Um, and the rotating nozzles put down water a lot slower, which means that it's soaking into the soil uh, uh, better. Okay, so, um, but you need to increase your run time. So for example, if I need to water a lawn uh, 10 minutes a week or 10 minutes a day for um, a spray head, it may be 30 minutes a week for a rotating nozzle to get the same amount of water. Okay, so you need to remember that. When we first came out, when the, uh, the companies first developed uh, rotating sprinkler nozzles, the uh, contractors did not know that they needed to increase the time. So the first thing they did was put all the nozzles back on, the spray nozzles, because all the lawns were dying because they weren't increasing the time to make up for the slow precipitation rate. And we're going to talk about that. Great. And the last one is how to do a drip system for potted plants. Um, what I generally suggest, I'm a very visual person. So I get out my gallon water jug and I would pour water on my potted plants. And I don't know if you can see behind me, but there's lots of succulents and potted plants in my garden and um, pour water on it. When you start to see the water come out the bottom of the pot, pay attention to how much water you've used out of your gallon jug. Drip irrigation is really versatile. Um, hang on a second. I need to make sure that, um, oops. Um, I got to make sure my computer doesn't decide to reboot all <laughs> on me. <laughs> but anyways, if it, uh, if I just need a quarter gallon of water, then I'm going to look for a drip emitter that only provides a quarter gallon in an hour. And that way I know that if I set my timer for one hour, I'll get my quarter gallon of water. If I have a half gallon dripper, then I'm only going to run it for 30 minutes because I'm going to get that quarter gallon in 30 minutes. And just pick the correct dripper for every single pot that you have. Great. So that's it. Um, feel free to continue to ask questions on the chat and uh, we'll have another break shortly. Okay. We're going to continue from our break time slide. Okay. So we've, we've talked briefly about, um, you know, landscapes and picking the right plants and improving our soils so that we can um, um, have just the right amount of water kept into our landscape um, and, and improving the capacity of our, our soils to hold water. Um, now we're going to talk about the irrigation system and we will go into um, information about uh, retrofitting the systems, uh, existing systems. And again, our goal is to use as much of your existing system as possible and not have to start from scratch. So we want to use your control valves that you have, if possible. We want to use um, the existing pipe in the ground, but we're going to change possibly the delivery system, the sprinklers themselves. Um, so all irrigation um, requires a correct operating pressure to work correctly. Um, we also want to make sure that we get good distribution uniformity in the landscape. And what that means is 
um, and I've talked about this several times, imagine where all the roots of your plants are. If you're putting in a five gallon tree, the roots are at the root ball. But in five, 10 years, the roots are out at the outside edges of the branch and that tree may be 15, 20 feet across. Every square foot of landscape underneath those, those branches is roots. So as I plan my garden, I wanna keep in mind the size of the plants and how I'm watering them. Another good example is um, if I, you know, I have a lot of succulents and if I decided to do a demonstration garden of uh, like six agave and that's all I'm putting in my front yard and I may have granite between all the plant materials. All I really need to do is to water those six individual plants and not the whole area between the plants. But in most gardens, I've got ground covers, I have small plants, I have, you know, the entire yard is full of plants. So if I have a, if I use my old lawn spray system, I may be able to water the whole garden. But if I change that to drip, I still need to provide water for every square foot of landscape out there, okay? So that's again why I'm, I prefer to use inline drip tubing laid out in a grid to water entire areas of root zone. And when you first plant, the plants are gonna be far apart and there won't be roots in those areas, but eventually there will be. So we wanna make sure that we design for that good uniformity of uh, distribution of water. And then we want to make sure that we manage the water properly. We don't want to overwater. We don't want to keep it too wet. Um, we don't want to water so much that the water is just going into the ground table. But we want to want to water enough so that the plant material gets the water it needs and doesn't dry out and reach that permanent wilting point. So that has to do with scheduling and that changes during the seasons of the year. And there goes my umbrella. We have like 365, four days of zero wind here. And the one day I put up umbrellas and screens, <laughs> I get a windy day. Okay, so if you see me floating away like the Wicked Witch in the, in the tornado storm, um, just make a note. Anyway, so I apologize for that. Could get exciting. So here's that watering curve that we talked about. And the blue line with the, the dark blue line with the blue dots is the actual plant water requirement. It's how much that plant needs to, to thrive in our landscape. And I'm not sure what the numbers are on the right. I think they may be in, in um, decimal form or, um, but they're not, it's certainly not in inches. But we usually look at that in inches of water so that June, July, August period is about four and a half inches of water in the month to keep my lawn green. But that changes for the plant materials that I have. So it would be less than that for shrub beds. It might be two and a half inches of water in the month divided by four and a half weeks in every month. Um, and that's kind of where we do look at the, as irrigation designers, that's what we look at how to water. Now that's really complicated for homeowners to understand and I'm gonna teach you a really quick way to get around this at the very end here, but in the meantime. Um, so the blue bars are just kind of an imaginary, this is how much water we sprinkled, okay? So in winter time, they're excessively overwatering, and in March they underwatered. So what we want to try to do is to not waste that water by overwatering, um, and to try to control our application of water so that we're matching the water requirement of the plants. And again, I'm going to give you a really great um, cheat at the end of this uh, lecture here for how to find out your watering schedule. Um, I was teaching a, there's a, a class called, a uh, program called QUEL, Q-W-E-L. 
and it's a, I think, 24 hours of uh, study, and all they do is teach you how to program a controller and water properly. So we're not going to, you know, there's just no way that homeowners uh, in general are going to be interested in, in doing that and learning that. So we've got a couple shortcuts that we can show you. So what is water waste? Um, runoff is water waste. If you water, if you're applying water too fast for the soil to absorb it, it collects and it often runs off into the landscape. Okay. Um, it also, uh, if it if you're watering the sidewalk, the sidewalk's not going to grow any more than you know it can. So um, you know we don't want to water the sidewalks or the streets. Um, we don't want to overwater past the root zone. So we may have a very efficient system and um, um, to water, but um, um, if we overwater uh, for too long a period of time, uh, the water goes right past the root zone. And again, that water is wasted. And we don't want to water more than the plants require. Um, so um, apparently, uh, so that, uh, Cal Davis um, University, they did some studies where they worked with uh, Indian hawthorn plants and they, you know, they, each plant would get a different amount of water every week. And um, what they found was that, you know, if you watered it too little, they looked pretty crummy and you watered a little bit more and they looked a little bit better. And at some point the watering was matched, you know, was perfect. The plants were growing, they were flowering, uh, they were perfectly healthy. And what they found was that the more water they gave it past that perfect point, the plant didn't look any nicer. So any more water than that plant absolutely needs at the low end um, is just wasted water. And then other things we want to do is to improve the uniformity of our irrigation and water the root zone of the plants. If we're watering large areas where there are no plants and we don't expect any roots over there, um, then that's wasted water. So we want to maybe want to cap some heads off on that side of the house where you've, where you've, all the plant material is gone. Um, we want to improve our soils. If we get runoff because of clay, we want to reduce the compaction and we want to include, reduce uh, the, the, the clay. Uh, so we're going to use amendments such as uh, um, uh, gypsum and uh, mulch and compost to um, help break up the, the clays. And if we have sandy soils, we want to do the same thing. We want to improve the, the, um, the ability of the soil to actually hold the water. We don't need to worry about the infiltration, which is the water going through the soil. We're trying to hold the water in the soil, so we want to add more organic material. And then another trick, um, one of the questions we had was, I've got spray heads, you know, how do I water um, with, to reduce runoff? And the way to do it is most controllers have the ability to, multiple, to do multiple start times. You just need to remember that every sprinkler that's on that program will come on two or three times if you set it uh, with different start times. So you might water at 2 a.m., 4 a.m., and 6 a.m. So if I needed, if, uh, if Steve's telling me I need to water 10 minutes three days a week, 10 minutes each day, maybe I'm watering three minutes at 2 three minutes at four and three minutes at six. And that way I'm getting my 10 minutes, nearly 10 minutes of water. And it's allowing that water to soak into the soil. Drip systems water so slowly and so do overhead uh, um, rotating sprinklers water so slowly that I can run it for 20, 30 minutes often without any runoff. Now that might not be true on a slope and it might not be true on um, uh, like a very clay soil. But the trick is to turn on your sprinklers, watch them run, sit there with your phone on timer or you're watching your watch. And the second you start to see excessive water running off or collecting, 
you mark that on your timer and say, okay, well, I can, I can water up to four minutes without runoff. Or if you have rotating sprays, you're watching it, and I can run those rotators for 10 minutes, and then it runs off. So um, you want to make sure, okay. Um, you want to make sure that you're not exceeding, that, that sets your run time, okay? That's the number of minutes that you're going to run and not exceed. But if I need more water, I'm doing multiple start times. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about this more when we get to the controller section. Uh-oh, my arrow's not working. Okay, so this is one of my favorite uh, photos. Um, this is an irrigation system in your yard. When you typically come up, um, hopefully you can see my little arrow. Um, when you come up to an irrigation system and you look at a yard, you don't see sprink. You typically don't see sprinklers unless you've got a valve right in front of your front door. But um, um, you know, and that's on purpose. We want to look at the garden. We don't want to look at the sprinklers. And if we start out here at the street, right behind the street, you're going to have your house water meter. And that's going to have a line that goes from the meter to the house. And then at the house, you're going to have a shutoff valve and often a pressure reducer for the house. We never want more than 65 pounds of pressure in the house. Any more than that, and things like your ice maker, your washing machine, your dishwasher with little tiny pipes could blow out and suddenly we're replacing kitchen cabinets and floors and walls and stuff. So we never want more than 65 pounds in the house. And often street pressure can be anywhere from 40 pounds. I think they're required to get you at least 40, 45 pounds, but it can be as high as 200 pounds some places in the Livenheim Water District. Um, the reason is we're trying to get water up and down the hills and people on your same water line may be at the top of the mountain and you're at the bottom. So you're getting much more pressure than they would. So somewhere on that line is a T and that T goes to, the, to a mainline pipe, which is under pressure all the time. And that goes to your control valves, okay? So just like the pipes in your house, when the control valve opens, water comes out, okay? So it's under pressure all the time. So that if you accidentally put a shovel through that, it's gonna get very exciting very fast. You're gonna have water all over the place and it's under pressure. So a 24 hour a day leak could be in that piece of pipe, okay? Now, Again, I'm hoping you can see my little arrow, but right here, you're gonna want a shutoff valve so that if I do spring a leak or I need to work on my control valves, I can go to this ball valve, pr preferably a ball valve and shut it off. And then I can work on my irrigation system without having to worry about a leak. Um, if you don't have one of those, and many people don't, this is a good opportunity to install one, okay? Also, if you've got a pressure reducer on the house, you may want a pressure reducer on your irrigation system. And it would go in this exact same location right after the ball valve, okay? That would control the pressure for all of your control valves, which is a great way to, to get your system under control. Now in this particular example, we're looking at a, um, a reduced pressure backflow preventer. This is not a common thing for most homeowners. This is something for commercial sites or really large properties. But what it does is it's keeping any debris that could collect in your yard and your sprinklers from being back siphoned into the public water supply, okay? So if you don't have one of these, and again, most people don't, you're gonna have one of these. So if you look at my picture, um, in the uh, picture in picture here, um, you can see a control valve. The one, the side with the wires on it is the valve. 
and this side is the backflow prevention. And the way it works is this has to be 12 inches above the highest head on the circuit. If any back pressure happens or back siphoning, the water actually flushes out of the top of this valve and that's supposed to happen. That's how it works, okay? And this is what most people will have, okay? We'll see some additional pictures in the slides. So after the main line and you've got your wires going to your timer and you, can, you know, usually on the side of the house or in the garage. After the main line, you've got your control valves and then we have what are called lateral pipe. These lateral pipes are only under pressure when the valve and sprinklers are turned on. So if you have a crack or a leak in one of these pipes, they only leak when they're turned on. So you can turn off that particular valve at the timer or at the valve in most cases um, and work on it like in the weekend, right? So that you're not watering all week with a big leak on your sprinkler. You can um, work on it later. Um, but if, it's, if you have a leak in the main line, it's under pressure at all times and therefore it will leak 24 seven. So that's a leak you need to fix right away. The way you find those is looking using your water meter. And again, having a um, service uh, person come out to your house uh, through the conservation department, um, they can help you show you exactly how to, to read your water meter and how to check for leaks. And then we go out these lateral pipes and we see the various sprinklers here. Okay, these are pop-up sprinklers. So you really don't see them. They're flush to the ground, sprinkler pops up. These are big water cannon rotors. And we even have a drip system over here. All drip systems require a filter and an additional pressure reducer. Drip is all compression fit. There's no glue used on these lines. And if you get too much pressure in these systems, all your little spider bubblers and little micro sprays and even your uh, tubing can pull apart, will be blown apart. So you, always want to install, if you're retrofitting these sprays and changing them into drip, you want to change that into a pressure reducer and a filter and then like this, and then run out to your drip to your plants. There we go. So um, water meters are great tools. Um, again, I would have someone come to your home and show you how to read the water meter. Um, but you can actually measure um, how many gallons per minute are going through any circuit. Um, you can also use, look for leaks. So if you think your water bill is excessively high, go out to the water meter, make sure no one's using water in the house and the sprinklers are all off and then look at the water meter. And if you look at the water meter, there's these little dials. In this case, it's a center dial in this case, it's this tiny little red dot on the side. If those are turning, then water is going through your water meter. And typically one full turn on one of these is about a quarter cup of water or something like that. So it's very little water. One unit that you pay for is 748 gallons, right? So a quarter cup is not a lot of water and, and you need a lot of quarter cups before you're even billed for that first unit of water. But if you have a 24 seven leak because your water meter is spinning when you're not using water anywhere on the property, it will add up and you wanna try to track that down. And again, that's a great uh, time to, to have a, somebody come out and consult on your property. Irrigation controllers. So we've come a long way. Um, luckily, I don't see a lot of the slot, the, the little slider type of uh, controllers anymore, although occasionally people will still have them. Um, I don't recommend replacing timers unless they're completely malfunctioning, but then sometimes they are. Um, but uh, most controllers will have the following features, okay? Um, they'll have multiple start times available for each of the controller programs, right? So program A, all your sprinklers will be on program A. You may start it at 1 p.m., 5 p.m., you know, two times a day. Oh, well, no, I'm sorry, a.m. 
You're only watering at night or in the morning. Um, you're typically watering on a 30-day calendar or, or um, um, essentially a weekly calendar. Most people are, you know, mowing on one day a week. So rather than have it water when it needs to, they're watering on Tuesday and Thursday. Um, you may have more than one program available to you. Okay, so um, you may have an A program on which you're gonna put your lawn and that's gonna allow you to do all the lawn zones or stations three days a week. But your shrubs, you're gonna put those on program B and those are only gonna water two days a week. Now, if you, uh, most people I find it's easiest to just tell them to put them all on the program A and water the same days and times uh, a week. You're just adjusting how many minutes. But if you know how to program and, and can do a little more complex programming using the A and the B, um, you just want to make sure that your lawn is only on A, that the number of minutes are only when you have the switch turned to A. And when you turn to B and look at station one, which is lawn, it's zero minutes. Because otherwise you'll be running them on two programs and watering a lot more than you want to. Um, one cool thing is that I believe that there are still rebates for what are called smart controllers. And smart controllers come in various uh, forms and, and uh, styles. Um, the simplest one has a program in the timer, okay? So you don't have to connect to the web. Um, you simply punch in your zip code and it knows um, essentially the percentage of difference between summer and winter. And when you put in a summer schedule of 10, say 10 minutes, it's automatically changing that to say uh, three minutes in winter time. And it's doing it because it knows that it's now January, right? So it's automatically adjusting the timer. You just want to make sure that when you're setting those timers, you're paying attention to the landscape. Um, usually it takes about two years to get the exact programming correct um, because you don't want to get to a situation where, um, you know, I'm just going to start it and forget it. And suddenly um, we get some dry spells or, you know, or, or it's drier than expected um, or you've misadjusted it and your plant material gets to wilting point, right? So, and then all of it dies. So we want to make sure that you're monitoring your landscape as your uh, schedule's adjusting itself. The coolest features on some of these controllers are that they're actually connecting to a local weather station, so at a golf course or an airport, and it's actually adjusting. It knows that today is cloudy, and it's actually adjusting your schedule today for that cloudy day, right? Or it knows that it's hotter than usual before. Um, so those are the coolest kinds, and and of course, you know, the simplest ones are going to be less expensive. The coolest kinds are going to be more. So those are the two types. The historical is where it's actually built into the timer. And the weather station is where it's actually connecting to the web or to a satellite or to your phone. Um, there are things, if you look in the middle of this picture, um, this is actually a weather sensor that you can have on your property. But right next to it is something that everybody should have. And they can fit on any timer. And that's a rain shut off, okay? Because typically it's going to rain at three o'clock in the morning. No one's going to jump up and turn their timer off, right? Mm -hmm. So um, if, uh, if that happens, this will actually get wet and open the common wire on the timer. The timer is happily watering, but no electricity is going out to the valves. These, and, and when it dries out, then it allows the timer to start watering again. You can get these in wired and wireless versions, and uh, they're really great uh, things that everybody really should have. Um, they should be mandatory, really, for everybody. Um, I'm not going to really go into flow meters. Those are really for larger uh, properties. 
but on a larger property, there is a way of actually measuring the amount of water that's going through your irrigation system. And it can detect if uh, typically it'll, it'll do what it's called learning. And it learns that uh, zone one is 30 gallons a minute. And if zone one accidentally suddenly becomes 35 or 40 gallons a minute because there's a broken sprinkler, it'll actually, the timer will shut that station off. Okay, so it's a much more expensive uh, solution and usually a design for larger properties and commercial uh, buildings. But if you've got a large property, that may be something to uh, consider. The tricky bit is you have to get a wire from the flow meter to the timer and the flow meter is typically going to go out at that uh, shutoff valve uh, wherever your connection is to the to the water meter. So here's a rain sensor and an ETO sensor. Um, moisture sensors, um, they can be helpful, but the problem is they're so localized and you usually only get one on one valve. So if it's in a location that's like shady and the rest of the yard is sunny, that could be a problem. Um, and if it's in the sunny spot and not the shady spot, that could be a problem. Um, the other thing is that our soils are really salty and, and reactive here, which means that they, they um, um, essentially um, create electrolysis and metal deteriorates very quickly. So often soil sensors are not the most effective way to, um, to monitor the water. I find using a soil probe or a shovel and actually digging in your garden is a better way to monitor the soil moisture. So here's a picture of a reduced pressure backflow device on the left and the anti-siphon control valves on the right. And on the right hand side, these are drip valves. So you see a filter and a pressure reducer at the valve. And if you're doing a retrofit, this is a difficult thing to add to the valve because the valves are already in place. They may be much closer together than this. So it becomes harder to do. But if you wanted to add those to an existing valve, you could dig in front of the valve and put it in a box in the ground on the lateral line. And that might be an easier solution for retrofitting the spring, uh, to a drip system on, a, on an existing spray valve. I like this uh, picture because it shows the valves are far enough apart. They're also 12 inches above the ground. Um, the beauty of this is, is if I have a, an, a broken valve, I can unwind that valve from the riser without having to cut any pipes because the valves are far enough apart that I can turn that thing in a full circle without and remove it without messing up the other valves. This is not what I normally see. Normally I see the valves one right on top of the other, which makes repair almost impossible. So if you're doing a big installation, I might recommend rebuilding your entire manifold so that the valves are cleanly installed and have enough and are far apart to work far enough apart to work on it. But if you're only doing a really small little renovation or just converting some sprays to, to drip, then that might be a little more work than you want to take on. Here we are, we're measuring pressure on the house. Um, in this particular case, the, um, the pipe coming out of the middle and going up to the pressure reducer is that bell shaped item and then going into the house wall. That's the service line. And then you've got a T and it goes to the right and there's a ball valve, a shutoff valve for the irrigation system. Now, if that pressure at the street is high enough, I might have put the same kind of brass uh, pressure reducer on the irrigation system after the ball valve. Okay, pressure is very important in sprinklers. All sprinklers work at a specific pressure. So in the pr picture on the right, those this, uh, the, the item on the left on the white T, that's a spray head. Typically those work at 30 pounds per square inch. If they get more than that, they missed off. On the right, we have a rotating sprinkler nozzle. Those typically work ideally at 40 PSI. 
So you need a little more pressure for those to work properly. Again, with too much pressure, those can mist off. You're also going with too, with way too much pressure, you're gonna blow out seals on your sprinklers, blow the heads off um, and damage your system. So pressure, too much pressure is, is really bad for the system. Anything more than 60 pounds is really um, too high for most sprinkler systems. Um, so if you take the four day class, I believe that they're still coming out and doing some uh, working with people and, and doing pressure tests on site. But you can do this yourself. Um, you're just getting a pressure gauge and finding some fittings that can work. But um, when we're doing a full on audit, we'll take pressure readings at the sprinkler. And again, we wanna see pressure between 30 and 40 pounds at, the, at most sprinkler heads. And we control that using pressure reducers, like a big one. That's for an entire uh, system. They're expensive. They could be 100 bucks, 150 bucks, depending on how big. Um, but that brass unit on the left will control the pressure for all of the sprinklers in your whole yard. On the right hand side, you can see a pressure reducer that is added to the valve and can control pressure on a single circuit. And then there are also sprinklers that are built with pressure reducers in the sprinklers themselves. Now those ones that are built in the sprinkler, um, you're gonna pay more for that sprinkler and it can't take more than 60, 70 pounds at the head before again, you're gonna have problems with seals and things. But what it can do is evenly distribute the pressure to all the sprinklers so that they're all exactly 40 or 30 psi. And when you go to the um, when you go to site one or you go to Grand Jettos or Ewing or any of the other irrigation supply stores, you'll see that these sprinklers come in different pressure ranges, and you want to get the correct pressure range for whatever sprinkler you're using. So here's a picture of a nearly perfect sprinkler operation. There's very little misting and all those little droplets are the exact same size. That's how it's supposed to work. And, we, and with spray heads and overhead sprinklers, we want to get head to head to head coverage. But this is what I normally see, okay? So I joke that when these folks uh, are watering, on the coast, Escondido gets two degrees cooler because none of this water is staying on the property. Look at the driveway, it's just absolutely soaked. Um, and that's mostly from the misting and not as much from overthrow. But in addition to the streets and sidewalks being wet, all your windows, all your stucco, the eaves of your house are all getting soaked and that's causing deterioration on your house. The other thing is that you're gonna start seeing with this much pressure, this is like nearly 100 pounds of pressure at these sprinklers. You're gonna start seeing breaks in the, in the sprinkler heads. They'll blow out much more frequently. So we want to get the pressure in the system to look like this. And you do that by installing pressure reducers in the system. If you have a really large property um, and a really large lawn area then you, or, or slope, you may have rotors. Rotors need more like 40 to 60 pounds of pressure to work properly, okay? If they look like this, then they're not getting enough pressure. And what you might be able to do is to retrofit this down to a rotating sprinkler instead of a rotor which is a less expensive head to maintain anyways, but um, which only requires 40 pounds to work. But the trick is that um, this head could be throwing out one or two gallons a minute per head and a rotating sprinkler puts out three tenths of a gallon per minute per head. And depending on the size of the rotor, um, reducing the amount of water going out can increase the pressure available. You're not actually increasing the amount of pressure you have, but you're just kind of reducing the flow and therefore 
um, the pressure goes up. So um, to nearer what it is coming into the system. So, um, you know, this is not operating properly. There's a lot more, we're getting really bad uniformity. So you get what we call donuts. You got dry areas and wet areas, right? So that's not good. And this, you know, we, we show people lawns because it's really dramatic what's, what's going on here. But if this was all ground cover, it would look the same. The, there you have dead areas and green areas in the ground cover because every square foot is covered with roots and we want an even distribution of water across all the root zone of the plant material. And here's what we're talking about, okay? So good uniformity at the top. Essentially, we're trying to water that entire root zone to the right amount, okay? If we're overwatering past the root zone, that's wasted water. If we've got dry and, and wet areas, then we're not using water. We could be watering exactly as much as we're supposed to, but we're not applying it properly. And therefore we're wasting water, overwatering some areas while underwatering others. So things that affect uniformity, okay? If you're using overhead sprays um, or even drip for that matter, sprinkler spacing, I often see people retrofitting their um, spray system to little spider bubblers, okay? But they haven't put out nearly enough spider bubblers. They've got wet spots and then dry spots. So sprinkler spacing is really important. If you're gonna use uh, little spider bubblers, then you're gonna be putting out hundreds and hundreds of spider bubblers so that you're watering evenly across all the root zone. If you use inline drip tube, then you've got a dripper every 12 or 18 inches and a row every 12 or 18 inches and the entire root zone is getting watered, okay? Um, typically, you don't wanna mix nozzles or equipment. So I often see drip added to sprays and while this might provide a little extra water to particular places that aren't getting it, it's really not the best way to solve the problem. Sprays are putting out wildly different amounts of water than um, your drip system, okay? Plant interference. I always joke about the agapanthus right at the corner that's blocking all the spray for the rest of the bed. Right behind the agapanthus, completely dry. Dig the agapanthus up, move it, somewhere else a few feet away from the sprinkler, okay? They transplant very easily and that'll allow those sprinklers to spray up and over the plant material and you'll get better uniformity. The other thing I suggest on every single home I see when I do these water use evaluations is just people need to do a tune-up and every spring you should be tuning up your system identify where you have a tilted sprinkler and straighten it up. Um, once you've done this, you won't really probably have to do it for another couple years. But every time they mow, every time you weed whack or people play in the yard is a chance for sprinklers to get tilted and, and, and not be properly working. Um, the arcs go out, adjustable arc nozzles can often go past their half circle setting and be watering the paving. So again, go out on a Saturday, take a cup of coffee, turn on your sprinklers and make notes about what's going on with each of your sprinkler circuits. And again, uh, drip can be just as bad if you're watering pots and the water's just, you've got a five gallon an hour dripper and you're only, you know, in a tiny pot and all the water's going over the patio, change that dripper, okay? And then broken equipment. You wanna look carefully at all the sprinklers. Often the brakes are in the bushes or in places that people don't notice. Anywhere you see water puddling and pooling, you wanna to try to understand where that's happening, okay? Or why it's happening. If I look at the spray and it's shooting into the agapanthus and I have a puddle, okay, I just need to move the agapanthus. But if there's nothing in front of the sprinkler and there's a big pool of water, look around the sprinkler and you may see water bubbling up from underneath the sprinkler, okay? 
Um, and that just means that, you know, it could be a bad leak. It could be a simple leak, but it's a leak. This head is, you know, could have been blown off by high pressure, but it also may have been run over, right? So um, if you have sprinklers that are constantly getting run over, then maybe you can move the sprinkler um, to a location that won't be hit by a car. Um, otherwise, you just need to, to pay attention. Um, the other thing you can do is you can, in, if you don't have swing joints, which is a piece of pipe that attaches to the bottom of the sprinkler and then attaches to the, the lateral pipe, the plastic pipe, um, those are made so that if you step on the sprinkler, the sprinkler actually moves out of the way without breaking the pipe. Okay, so um, that might be something to look into. Here's a different kind of valves. Most people are gonna use the valve on the left at the top, which is an anti-siphon control valve. Inline straight valves are only for use if you've got a different type of backflow preventer, like a reduced pressure backflow device, okay? And on the right side, you've got essentially the perfect valve manifold, which is a grouping of valves all in line um, but it's also installed with a pressure reducer and a filter because these are all drip valves. We talked about spray heads and rotating sprinklers and rotors. So rotating sprinklers and rotors are actually pretty efficient if they're used properly. Um, rotors are great for big slopes, but you need to be um, paying attention to the pampas grass that grew up over one of the heads. Okay, so if it's, if it's blocking the spray, you're getting a huge concentration of water with that rotor over that plant. So over time, you're going to want to um, uh, possibly remove plant material or trim the plants up so that the rotors can water efficiently underneath the plant materials. Oops, wrong way, sorry. Um, okay, so... I am really a big proponent of overhead spray wherever it's appropriate. And those are larger areas. They're the simplest retrofit to do. You're essentially unscrewing the old nozzle from the top of um, the sprinkler head and putting on a new nozzle and you don't even have to dig it up. So again, I'm not, hopefully you can see this. This is a pop-up head. And if you look at the top, Oops, it says 40 PS or uh, 30 PSI. So that's for a spray head. And if I pop this up, I can unscrew the nozzle and it has a filter on there. And oh, look at how dirty that filter is. So I'm gonna go clean that in my sink or replace the filter. And then I come back out and I can put either a rotating nozzle on or replace it with a spray, another spray. But whatever it is, if I'm doing rotating nozzles, I want all rotating nozzles on my circuit. If I'm doing spray heads, I want all spray heads on my circuit. Because of match precipitation rate, spray heads have a much, put down a lot more water, three times as much water in the same amount of time as a rotating sprinkler. The reason I like them is because I can see them. I can see the coverage. I can see if they're broken, okay? And they cover a really large area. And those are most of the sprinklers that you have right now. So if you can use this exact same locations for all your spray heads, that's the least expensive way to retrofit your system. And don't mix and match. So here's a spray head and you can see the grass is a lot greener here on the spray head side than the rotor. If you're gonna use drip, and I do recommend drip all the time, the primary place I recommend drip is all those little narrow beds around the house, okay? Spray heads don't work well, even spray heads don't work well under say six feet of distance, okay? You're spraying the stucco off the house often, you're, the plants are blocking the spray, um, you're spraying the patio, so if you can convert that entire circuit to drip, then you're getting all the spray off the house and um, you're getting it into the beds, okay? And you're watering that whole root zone. 
So here's um, the two top pictures are uh, inline drip irrigation. This is a layout before you would mulch. Here we have a tree. So we want to water that whole root zone. Now that brand new tree is only grow, you know, the roots are right at the base of the tree in that first ring. But by watering out past that ring, I'm going to coach all those roots to reach out into that zone and help stabilize the tree and be a healthier tree. You can either do inline drip under lawns. Um, it's a little tricky, but it can be done. Point source drip is an individual dripper. And in the case of these uh, blue glow uh, agave, um, you don't need to water the area between under the rock. I just need to water that individual plant. So I might put drippers halfway between each of those two plants. That way each dripper is watering two plants and causing, you know, allowing the roots to, to grow between them. And then bubblers, I talked about that at the very beginning. I really prefer if you use fixed gallon bubblers. They come in like half gallon a minute, one gallon a minute, two gallons a minute. And you just, everything on the circuit, you're just managing. If you're doing all citrus on one circuit, then you're picking the, the bubbler based on uh, the size of the tree. And then you know that if I run it for five minutes and it's one gallon per minute, I'm getting five gallons of water on that tree. And if it's a mature, big, huge citrus, I just think to myself, oh, five gallons of water on that tree? No, that's not anywhere near enough water. So maybe I include, uh, you know, I'm doing multiple start times of three minutes or I'm running it for 10, 20 minutes as long as I don't have runoff, okay? Um, there are multi-outlet emitters with this quarter inch tube. I'm not, a bit, I used to use this all the time because it was what we were given. Um, inline drip tube was not really developed early on. Um, the problem with this is that the tubes pull off or blow off. Um, also, if you try to rake, you've got this rat's nest of all these little quarter inch, eighth inch tubes all over the place. And they become really hard to manage and kind of unsightly. So again, there are places where this is perfectly appropriate, but my preference is to use inline drip tube um, with a low precipitation rate. Okay, and all systems require filters, right? So if I'm using an existing system and I don't have a pressure reducer and a filter on my valve, I can get this kit over here on the right that goes at the sprinkler head that has a pressure reducer and a filter in it and install that out in the landscape. Or I can dig up a lateral pipe, cut into it and install that filter on the left-hand side. And I wanna make sure that I put that in a box because you need to maintain these filters. They will get uh, build up of calcium carbonate or, or uh, uh, even algae. Um, sand and rock, and um, you need to clean them out periodically. After you've done that a couple years in a row, you'll figure out how often you need to clean those. And here's some cut sheets uh, from Rainbird in this particular example um, of different products that are available. You can go to any of these manufacturers' websites, and they have videos on how to do it and great pictures of the products and lists of the products. Make yourself a list and then go out to um, one of your uh, irrigation supply places and see if you can find the, the materials, make a list. One thing I will point out, if you're using inline drip tube, in this case, a Rainbird product, make sure all of the fittings are manufactured by the same person as the pipe. Because if you try to get a Toro fitting to fit on that Rainbird pipe, you're gonna be very disappointed. I can't remember if it's too big or too little, but it's either impossible to put it on or it just comes flying off the second you pressurize the line because their drip tubing are different sizes. There's, they're not manufactured, uh, the different products are, are manufactured at different tolerances. So you wanna make sure that if you're using Netafem or Toro or Rainbird or Hunter, that you're getting their fittings to use on their products. 
Here's a quick install, just kind of an idea of what you can do by changing this spray head into an inline drip tube. And that, um, that device that you see here on the right, essentially you can throw away the can and just drop the filter and the pressure regulator into that sprinkler it needs to be a Rainbird body and convert that into a drip. And all the other sprinklers in that bed, you can turn off. You can uh, cap them off or just turn them off. You won't need them anymore because you're providing all the water through the strip system. Here's another inline drip tube system. Now, I would argue that this isn't the most efficient way to have laid this out. My layout would be to take individual pieces of pipe 20, 30 feet long and lay them out in rows like we saw under that lawn. There's less cuts involved if you're just laying it out in a grid in rows, okay? You're watering all of the bed. In this particular example, there's actually dry areas um, between these strip tubes. Well, that uh, tree is gonna root into all those areas. So you really want the whole thing watered, okay? Again, I'm trying to think about where the root zone is and laying it out the simplest way pro possible. And if I laid this out in rows, say 18 inches on center, and then tied them together at the ends, um, it'd be a much better way to water. They also have this little quarter inch inline drip tube. So this was an install that I did. These are both actually jobs that, that I installed or that I had installed. Um, um, I have an individual little kangaroo paw that's sitting six feet from the next plant. So I put a little drip tube that has two drip emitters, one on either side of the plant. And those drip emitters are one gallon for every hour. So I know that if I run it for 30 minutes, I'm getting uh, a half a gallon or one gallon for that plant with two drippers. And I'm watering both sides of the root zone. On the right, we used inline drip tube in rows and we planted daimondia. And this was a risk because daimondia is just insanely flat. So it's really hard to get um, watered properly, but we were able to get that to establish and completely cover all those drip tubes. So when you're picking out your drip or your, your equipment, you wanna think about the plant material you're watering for example, do I really want to spray roses? Probably not. Maybe I want to use bubblers for those. You're looking at your soil texture and the rate related capacity. Are you on a slope? How much of your existing system can you use? Uh, one thing to keep in mind is if you're converting an area, you want it to be entirely one irrigation zone. I don't want to take out half a lawn if it's watered on a single valve. So those are decisions that you make in the initial design process um, because otherwise I may have to modify or add a valve for the shrub bed. Um, available flow, those are things that we really need to consider as irrigation designers. Um, but in most cases, you don't have to worry too much about it. If you had enough water for a spray system it's going to have enough water for a drip or a, um, a rotating sprinkler system. And then maintenance requirements. Again, drip irrigation does seem to um, require a little more monitoring and maintenance than spray systems, but they all require monitoring and maintenance to some degree. Um, let's take questions real quickly. I'm not sure if I blew right past my two thirds point or not, but um, Sarah? All right. Yes, hold on one second. All right, um, I'm gonna scroll back up. Okay, can we get a little bit more information or description on inline drip systems? Okay, so inline drip. Maybe I can, how do I make my big screen bigger? Or my picture bigger.
You might be able to zoom down at the bottom of your page. Sorry about this. Well, the best thing I can suggest is go on YouTube, number one, okay? Every manufacturer has their own videos on how to install inline drip tube. But I'm gonna hold this up and hopefully you can see the little circle in the middle, but you can also see kind of a pill shape embossed in the plastic tubing. That's an emitter. That's no different than the little button type emitters or a little spider bubbler that you have in your garden that's on a regular drip system. And these are made so that every single one of them is the same and putting out the same amount of water in a specific amount of time. So when I go to the store, I'm gonna see a big roll of 100 feet of this and I'm gonna look on the label and it's gonna tell me that it's 0.6 gallons per hour for this dripper. And I'm gonna say, well, I have a clay soil that's a little fast. I wanna find the one that's 0.25 gallons per hour. And that's gonna put out half as, or like one third as much water as this one in the same amount of time. But then I need to increase my run time to make up for that. Cause I still need to water say an inch of water in that week, right? So these are manufactured inside the tube. I don't think you can see that, but maybe. Uh, they won't pop out, but they can pop apart because you're using compression tube uh, fittings on each of these tubes. Um, so you just want to make sure that that's the case. So again, YouTube videos are wonderful. There's, you know, sometimes you can see homeowners do it. I watched this one video, a young woman uh, put together a system and I'm thinking, geez, that didn't look right. I, I think she did something funny there. And uh, she came on in their next video and said, oh, a bunch of people texted me and said that I messed that up and she fixed it. Um, but the, the best uh, slides are from manufacturers and, and they'll show you what it is and up close and personal and you'll actually see people installing it, which is even more important. Great. So the next question is, if amending soil, how deep does the added material need to get worked in? Typically, we go down eight inches. That's usually enough to, to um, uh, affect a good root zone. Um, however, that said, there are a lot of folks that don't rototill or work it into the soil at all. Their argument is that if you lay mulches and, and compost across the top of the soil, um, that it will eventually chemis uh, chemically work its way into the soil. I don't have patience for that. And if you looked at my yard being solid uh, sandstone, I just don't believe that that'll work as easily. I would typically rototill or hand till eight inches down and work the mulching amendment in. Now, if you have an existing irrigation system, the first thing you wanna do is identify where the sprinklers are and then imagine where those pipes are because, um, and you may need to locate the pipes, like dig up one head and see which way the pipe's going. You do not wanna be rototilling across a, a lateral pipe that's only four inches deep, okay? So um, when I design a system, if it's installed properly, those lateral pipes are 12 inches deep down in the ground. That's pretty deep. Main line, which is under pressure all the time, should be 18 inches deep. So that way, if you're planting a one gallon plant, you're never gonna hit that main line by accident. Great, so we'll do two more. I know there was a lot more, but we'll make sure we get through the slide before 12. And if there's questions at the end, we can answer then. Um, but if you, if programs A and B control the same line, how do you separate lawn from shrubs? I'm assuming that's a device controller question. Yeah, so, well, so let's get some clarification on terminology. Um, 
a zone or a circuit um, is when you turn on one individual valve, it's all the sprinklers that come on when that individual valve comes on, okay? And if that single circuit waters both shrubs and lawn, then ideally you want to disconnect one or the other and you're going to have to get water to whichever one you disconnected. So that means adding a valve um, or modifying some other shrub bed to get water over to that shrub bed. Um, those are difficult things and often people I just tell them you just got to do what you have to do. You know, you're just going to have to water um, to keep that lawn alive. And what that means is you're overwatering the shrubs and just to get enough water for the lawn. And that may be the only thing that you can do short of adding a valve. Again, um, having the expert come out to your home is going to be the best solution. They're going to give you, you know, if, if there's an easy solution, they certainly should be able to recommend one. And then do you have any tips for locating a clogged line? Um, you're always tracking backwards. Um, typically it's at the nozzle. So if we look at the sprinkler, often these are you know popping up, but they're not turning. The screw's wide open. So what you need to do is grab it or find that head, take the nozzle off, um, typically turn the water off first, <laughs> um, and then clean out the filter. If you take off the head and you turn on the water and there's still no water coming out of this, um, you may have a break in a sprinkler line because it's really, having a clog in a lateral line on a built system is very unusual. Um, and really needs a professional to help you track it back if it's not at the sprinkler head, which is where it normally is. Great. So why don't we jump back into the presentation? And okay. like I said before, we can stay on later and answer questions after 12. Absolutely. All right. So, so here's a profile um, showing you the water, you know, just skating straight through the soil on a sandy soil. And in a clay soil, it spreads sideways and doesn't go as deep and takes much longer to get through that soil profile. So we want to water these very differently. We want to water the clay soil very slowly, but for longer periods of time so that it gets wet. On the left-hand side on the sandy soil, we're going to, um, we're going to water um, much more frequently but for shorter periods of time. Because if we water it too long, the water goes right past the root zone. I don't know what this is down here. <laughs> Please move this away from the screen, from the window. Okay, so please ignore whatever that means. And we'll go back. Um, so if you join the uh, four-day class, we help you do an irrigation design plan. Um, it's a little more complicated. It's not for everyday homeowners. Um, it's just, you know, it's not an impossible thing. Certainly not rocket science. But, um, you know, given pressure losses and pipe sizes and all sorts of things like that, doing an actual plan for a yard is, is a little more complicated. Um, again, there's entire college degrees based on irrigation design. So um, we're not gonna be able to cover that here. But um, the beauty of doing this is if you have your little site plan and locate all your sprinkler heads on that site plan, you can then figure out which ones you're gonna convert to drip and which ones you might need to cap off or remove. And drip is um, such low flow that you can often do that entire lawn area with one drip source, okay? So, um, um, you know, that, that would be, a, you cap off all the heads and source it from one drip line. If you've got lawn on both sides of the driveway, 
and they come on in the same zone, then you're going to have one source of drip on the right, and then you're going to have um, another source of drip on the left. Um, if you've got spray heads and you're not getting good even distribution, you may want to move some sprinklers or you could have a corner where you need to add a sprinkler. But again, you need to be careful when you're adding sprinklers. Um, if you add too much flow to the circuit, you can get um, problems with your pressure um, not being enough to work the sprinklers anymore. I'm going to drop this down real quickly. I apologize. I just want to see what is going on here. Move this away from the window. I don't know what that means. I'm afraid my computer may like decide to reboot itself here. So I want to make sure that nothing funny is going on. Okay. I don't know what that is. So we'll go back. Okay, so retrofit from sprays to rotating sprinklers when you think you have enough coverage on your sprinkler, okay? Um, <clears throat> and if you don't, aren't worried about um, the, uh, the plants blocking the sprays or if it's, and also if it's a large enough area. If it's a really tight zone, you may really want to convert to uh, drip irrigation. Okay, um, oops, irrigation, am I going the right way? Yes, I am. Um, so um, online, you can get uh, um, cut sheets for all the different products that are available. You might go down to your suppliers first and figure out which ones they have available. And then you can go online and look up uh, the Rainbird or, or Hunter products or Toro products or Orbit products that, that are available. Um, and then, and then you're, you're going to put it right on your plan that you're going to, you know, retrofit. My valves are like ancient. They're from the 1970s. And so therefore I need some new valves and I can get this three quarter inch valve. And, um, you know, it's got a backflow preventer on it. So that's what I'm going to use. And I'm going to rebuild my manifold and then ha have a brand new irrigation system working. And um, there's also details we've provided that are available. You'll get it with this uh, video as well as online, uh, showing you how the pipes go together and what parts you can use to assemble a um, uh, anti-siphon control valve properly. Um, honestly, six inches minimum is not code, it's 12, but um, you at least need six inches above grade or above the lowest sprinkler. Here's a sprinkler head and you can see that number six is that swing joint. The five and six is the, they've built it from scratch, but those have come available in um, uh, prefabricated units. Um, and if you can imagine that a car drives over the top of that sprinkler head, rather than cracking the pipe underneath, the pipe just, the sprinkler head just moves out of the way because of the swing joint. So those are really handy to use um, when you're uh, doing retrofit and, and doing a new sprinkler. Oops. Um, here's a bunch of nozzles um, showing you the pressure and the distances they go. Again, um, um, there's a million products out there. So getting some help from the uh, manufacturers and the distributors uh, is a great way to look. But for example, if you've got a 20 foot space, you don't necessarily want to use the MP1000 nozzle because it only goes up to 14 feet. Maybe I want to use the MP2000, which it goes to 19 feet. And I don't want to use an MP3000 because it's going to 30 feet and I'd have to turn it down to 20. So um, pick the correct nozzle for the space that you're irrigating. Um, as far as PVC pipe goes, I will just make the following recommendation. Use Schedule 40 PVC pipe. Um, try not to use Class 200 if you can help it. Um, class 200 is a thinner pipe and won't last as long. And with, with the, uh, all the rock and stuff that we have in our soils, 
it's typically better to use schedule 40 and certainly don't you know if, if all your pipe is a certain size three quarter inch or even half inch which would be bad but um, you know you don't want to go up in size unless you start at the valve and work your way out and again a professional designer or landscaper can um, help you resize pipe if, if it was undersized in the first place. Um, for drip irrigation, again, the really narrow beds or very isolated plant materials are often the best places to use drip irrigation. Okay, so if you've got, um, you know, three agaves and that's all you have in your entire front yard, then you don't want to water the spaces between those plants. We don't want to encourage um, weeds to grow. Hey, Steve, I think you might have uh, been muted. Am I Stop muted? Stop hearing you. Oh. Now you're no. back. Now you're back. You're good. Okay. Well, that was just kind of weird on its own because I didn't think I did anything. So how much have we did, I miss, did you miss? Just a little bit. I'd go back like a, a minute. Okay. All right, so PVC pipe, I think I was talking about. I recommend using Schedule 40 PVC pipe. Um, it's got a, a thicker wall and it'll last longer. Class 200's thinner. Um, and then if you, you know, if, if you're thinking that you have, well, if you dig in the ground and your, your pipe is barely two inches deep and it's half inch, I would consider talking to a contractor and having that all redone half inch pipe is not big enough to run the amount of water that most sprinklers will use. Um, it's also typically a really thin walled pipe, um, but I would have a professional help you with that. Pipe sizing is a big part of what we do as professionals. If you're doing drip irrigation, again, the best places to use drip, um, one example would be if I'm only planting three agaves across the front of my property. I don't want to water the space between those plants. It would encourage um, uh, weeds and, and uh, uh, you know, there's no roots out there. So I might use drip with a drip ring around each of the plants. That way I'm getting water all the way around the plants. I may have two or three or five drippers around each, of each plant. And I probably want to make those drippers bigger in three years, okay? Make the, make the rings larger because the roots will be further out from the plant. And those beds that are right next to the driveway or right next to the house, um, you know, along the side of the house, really narrow areas, um, those are really ideal for inline drip or any kind of drip uh, tubing rather than having sprays. Uh, my rule of basic rule of thumb is if the bed is wider than eight feet, I will probably encourage using overhead sprinklers. The problem is if you're using drip, if you get a dripper that's that's broken off or not working and it's four or five feet from the sidewalk, you may not see it, you may not know it's broken, um, or it may be under a dense planting of lantana or ceanothus. And to find the leak, I've got to break the plant to try to find it. So. Again, I prefer using overhead sprays for those uh, particular locations, okay? Um, here's a valve with an inline valve with a drip filter. Um, inline valve, you'd only use that if, it's, um, if you have a backflow preventer. Um, this particular unit is a pressure reg regulator and a filter in a small unit which is great for retrofitting onto um, circuits. You also need, need to be careful with uh, the size of the valves. Um, valves are set for certain flows and if they don't have the correct flow to choose from, um, they may not shut properly. And typically that's ultra low flow. If it's less than a gallon a minute, some valves may have trouble closing. So if you're picking new valves, um, you want to make sure that in the chart that it says that it will flow um, down to that uh, specification, okay? Um, 
And also, in most cases, you're going to want an anti-siphon control valve, not one of these inline valves for a home for a, a typical installation on a home. Oops. So it's going to look like this, not like that. So again, we've provided some details. Um, this has a the filter and pressure regulator on it. Here, the number six is a union. That allows um, maintaining the valve without cutting the pipe. So if you need to review, remove that valve, you can just unbolt that union and then unscrew the whole valve from the riser. Again, more head conversion kits. Um, I, I recommend that, again, you look through um, the documentation. I don't want to spend a lot of time. These are the fittings for the drip, compression fittings for drip. They don't use glue in most cases. This is all compression fitting. So you have to make sure that the pressure is low. Um, inline drip tubing choices, again, catalog cuts. Okay. Um, so when you're doing your project, you're going to do any demolition, removal of bad plants, removal of, of uh, invasive plants that you have on the property, removing your turf. You're going to contour the landscape. Um, if you're doing swales or you're doing mounds, ideally anything that comes out of the swale becomes a mound. We don't want to haul off any dirt. You do your soil prep. One thing that I didn't touch on, um, when you're doing that, um, you're digging your 12 by 12 by 12 pit, you can put um, about, you know, fill up a sandwich baggie with soil and you can send that to an agricultural um, uh, chemical analysis company and they'll provide you, you tell them that you're growing ornamental uh, plants and you want a set of recommendations and it's about 75, 80 bucks to have that done. You only need to do it once for the, generally for the property, bigger properties, maybe twice, but um, they will send you back a soil analysis and tell you exactly the soil amendments and the quantities that you need to, uh, to do a perfect soil prep. Other than that, you want to use um, good compost, like probably an inch of compost. Um, or at least a half inch of compost spread over the whole thing, plus some other kinds of uh, wood shavings, composted wood shavings, um, and then work that into the top eight inches of the soil. You're going to put in your irrigation system. Now, I will say that some of my, co my uh, contractors will do the drip system after they plant so that they can make sure that they get drip to all the plant locations. But um, um, in most cases, you install the system first. Place your plants, eyeball it, move the plants around. It's the fun part of, of doing the design. And then go ahead and install. And then lastly, you need to maintain your property. You need to make sure that you get the weeds out before they set seed. If you wait for those, like I did, <laughs> if you wait for the grasses to all set seed, then next year you're going to have 10 times more grass to try to pull out of your landscape. So whenever possible, try to remove those as quickly as possible. Um, if you look at the installed picture, um, it's a little harder to cultivate between the ground cover plants, but you could certainly use a large garden rake or a cultivator, which is just a rake with three tongs to kind of work the ground between the yucca and the, and the plants and the boulders. And that's gonna, gonna uproot any weeds that are coming up very easily. It's also good for keeping the soil from becoming hard again, okay? So here we go. As part of um, the uh, landscape um, irrigation schedule, um, for one thing, when the guy comes out to your property as part of the water use evaluation through, uh, through, the, uh, through your water district, through um, Oceanside, they should provide you with a schedule, okay? So that's number one. Number two, I mean, I may talk, you know, people may be asking me here, I've got this soil and these plants and I'm in this location. Tell me how much I need to water. Well, it's still kind of a guess, but 
you know, I really need to know the infiltration rate and what kind of soils you have, how fast you're putting down, what kind of sprinklers you have. Um, the best way to check your root depth is to dig again, um, soil probes or shovels. And then how many days, what time of day, we talked about that a little bit, and water times how long. Well, that's really hard to calculate all on, you know, from scratch, we can do that for you. But rather than do that, and I'm gonna skip this to go to here. Go to bewaterwise.com and look on there for the watering calculator, okay? And when you hit on that watering calculator, it's gonna ask you to fill out a certain amount of information. It's gonna ask you what your zip code is, what your soil type is, what your plant type is. It's gonna give you choices for like uh, doing one for shrubs and doing two for lawn, okay? Or three for citrus. Um, and then you're gonna hit go, enter, and it's gonna actually kick out a schedule that looks like the one on the lower left. And it tells you the total number of minutes per week, per month. Okay, so in this case, it's kicking out, I don't know, 16 minutes a week in June, right? Or no, per start time, I'm sorry. What I look at is per week, and this must be a drip system. Yes, it is. So they're telling you to water nearly two hours a week. So if I'm doing that in two days, that's an hour a day. And if I'm doing that two times per day, two days a week, that's 30 minutes per start time, per day, twice, two days a week. And then I get my one hour of total watering, okay? So this is a really good tool to use. And then you're gonna go out in your garden and you're gonna water to the schedule and you're gonna say, oh my gosh, when I come back to my watering day, everything's still wet. So now I can back off that time, okay? Um, you know, maybe I don't need the hour, or maybe I'm using only 40 minutes. Okay, so, you know, we can, we can give you the best tools, we can give you the best part, but the fact that you're in this class means that you're learning as much as possible about your gardens and learning how to irrigate and the tools that are available to you. And again, there's just tons of resources online um, in the makeover series, again, they've got all these hyperlinks to various people and places and guides, okay? So put them to good use. All the manufacturers have their catalogs online. Um, in fact, it could be too much information for you, but um, that's why I recommend then, you know, take some ideas down to your local garden center or your um, local irrigation supplier and uh, ask them about what's, you know, what they think the best uh, idea is and take pictures of your garden so that they can kind of see what you're talking about when you're saying I've got this big lawn area or I have this big shrub bed area. They've got all the professional grade equipment. Some stores may have one product over another. So um, often I can find three bits, but I can't find that fourth bit and I have to go to another store to get that part. But um, typically the professional irrigation supply houses have everything you need. Um, and um, again, in, in different products. Product catalogs. Um, okay, so uh, last thing, um, if you decide that you want to hire a professional uh, designer, there are d landscape designers there's also landscape architects. I'm a landscape architect. I'm licensed by the state. I have a license to protect. So, you know, you know, I'm going to do you a good job. Um, and if I don't, you can call them and, and file a complaint and they can go after my license if I really screw up. Luckily, that hasn't happened in 45 years. So, um, you know, I count my blessings, but I hope that I'm doing a great job for my customers. Um, you can get lists of irrigation designers as well. Also contractors. So it's really important to um, check out these. Um, if you're getting a licensed contractor, uh, go to the state board and make sure that their license is, is in effect. If you get some guy off the, off the corner 
and he says he can do sprinklers, you take you always take a risk that he doesn't know what he's doing. Okay. Um, there's lots of rebates and incentives. Again, Sarah can help you that on a phone call some other time. And I apologize for this running late, um, but I think we're pretty much done. Yes, so we'll take some final questions. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, thank you so much, Steve. I'm gonna do a quick follow-up for those of you who have to jump off the call. Um, the, there will be a follow-up email sent out in the next couple hours that will have a bunch of links on there as well as a survey and some additional information. Um, the PowerPoint slides that were sent out along with your login do are clickable. So everything that Steve went through today, if you see some of those websites, you can open up those slides and you can click the links and it will take you right to that page as well. Um, so thank you so much, everybody, for joining. And I'm going to go through with Steve and answer these questions. Um, if you have to jump off and want to know these questions, the web recording of this will be posted on our website, freenotionside.org, in about a week. So you can go to the end of the recording and look at those questions. Okay, so the first one is the gentleman has a Wi-Fi based hunter control for his plants that have mixed water needs. So he has three zones all on one program. What does he do? He calls you and has your water use evaluation <laughs> person come over. And um, so we don't actually have that. It's a little different, but you can do the you can do the at home audit. So you'll have a link to that on your website that comes out on your email that comes out and they can come and help you with um, setting up your irrigation system. So it's a, it's a contractor. It's not a, a city employee, but they can come out and, and help you. Right. Yep. And that's what I meant. And um, yeah, <laughs> you know, basically, if you have you can put everything on a single program. You just need to make sure that you're adjusting the time, knowing that the same spray head is putting out, you know, the, the, the same amount of water. So if I need 10 minutes on a lawn, I might need only five minutes on the shrub bed. And it doesn't matter whether you're using the Wi-Fi controller and, and weather station or not. Um, you need to set your basic times for summer is typically what you do. And every other month is a percentage less than summer. And the timer will adjust that automatically, hopefully. So how often should you clean out rotating heads? Um, you should be checking your system periodically throughout the year. And anytime you notice that some of the sprinklers are spraying the wrong direction or are clogged, then it's time to clean them out. Um, you could go years without any um, having any problems at all, but um, other people may have get their system clogged pretty regularly. A lot of it has to do with, um, you know, the quality of the water. Um, people with well water have all kinds of problems and really need a good filtration system. What is the time watering difference between regular nozzle and a low rotor spray head? It's either double or three times. So if you think about it as a, the spray head being one, a rotating nozzle is 0.33. So that's a third as much water. So you need to increase, you either need to increase the amount of time with the rotating sprinkler by two thirds, right? To make up that one third um, or your or you're increasing your spray heads uh, probably double. Again, go to that BeWaterWise.com site and look up spray heads versus your rotating sprinklers, and it'll be pretty clear on the run times. Great. Is it better to use overhead sprayers for vegetable garden beds or drip irrigation? That's a personal preference. Most people, I, I think, usually if you're starting seed, you want some kind of overhead. But if you're doing, you know, if you've got tomatoes that are blocking all the spray, um, you may want, oops, I dropped out a full screen for some reason. That's um, okay. You can keep going. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, you may want drip, right? Because the larger right. plants are blocking the spray. 
And then how do you convert drip system with little tubes from individual heads to an inline drip? You use those conversion kits that we talked about, um, like this one. This is a sprinkler head, but not really. You open it up and inside is a pressure reducer and a filter. And that's how you convert it. There's different kinds of these, by the way. So again, go down to, you know, Grangetto's or Site 1 and ask them about the conversion kits and become familiar. Also go on YouTube and ask about it, okay? Or I mean, just qu query um, converting drip from spray and they'll have all kinds of videos. And it's a, why is the grid drip system connected on the slide that you showed? Is it connected between two laterals rather than one? It depends on how big an area you're doing. You can run drip tube 150 feet, um, but just remember that the first drippers are gonna get the water first. And the longer the run is um, through the drip tube itself, the last drippers aren't gonna get water for maybe even three or four minutes. So that front part's getting a lot of water and the back part's getting less. But if you source it from both ends, then your the water goes through the PVC pipe faster, fills all the drip tube together in half the time. So that's not a bad way to do it. Or you put the source in the middle of the bed and feed out from to either end, and that works as well. Some of their pots need to be watered twice a week. Can they use drip system to do this? Absolutely. Yeah, again, just pick the right dripper for the, for the size of the pot. Great. Is there a minimum distance from the foundation that plants should be placed? Um, typically, people like to keep um, a two-foot clearance all the way around the house. Um, that's usually not what happens. Um, any shrub is going to get wider than that. Um, but I probably wouldn't get them any closer than two feet. But having said that, if on the back of your house you've got a patio and you only have a bed that's 18 inches wide, then that's what you're going to plant in. You don't need to worry about it. But you're not going to put a tree in that 12, you know, that 18 inch planter. So you just need to pick smaller plants. How do you determine how many emitters can be on one valve? Um, you take a five year college program and <laughs> no, um, <laughs> it's all, you have to do pipe sizing. It's, it's a lot more complicated. Again, I think, you know, getting somebody to come to your home and take a look at that for you. Um, you can do a bloody lot of, you know, you're changing a spray, which is measured in gallons per minute to a drip, which is measured in gallons per hour. So that's a division of 60, right? So you can have, you know, literally 60 different drippers on a one gallon per minute sprinkler head, and it's the same amount of water. Um, so it, it does vary, but typically you don't have to worry about it because if you're going from spray to drip, you're going to be using so much less water, but count the emitters. If you know you have one gallon an hour emitters and you have 10 of them, that's 10 gallons an hour, right? Great. This person has about a 30 to 40 degree slope and is installing sprinklers and was wondering if they should install them along the bottom or if they should go from the top or if they should do both? Ideally, you do both. And ideally, you're using rotating sprinkler nozzles so that you don't get runoff. Um, if you're going to do one and not the other, I would do it from the top because the water will run downhill and it's easier to get the water to flow down or spray down than it is to shoot all the way to the top. Great. Is there a certain corner of a lawn, if a certain corner of their lawn is brown, is it the spray rotating a problem? 
The landscaper well, says that they need to water more. <laughs> ultimately, you need to water more, but but um, you know that's the short answer. <laughs> um, which means that the whole rest of the lawn is getting like goodles of water compared to that corner, which is just getting enough. What I recommend is turn your sprinklers on and figure out why that area is not getting water. It could be that there's a sprinkler head hidden underneath the lawn that's not popping up, or you've got nozzles that are cracked or pointed the wrong way. So that's the first thing to do is to tune up your system and kind of make a note of why is it that that's not getting enough water. Great. So that is it. Um, thank you so much for everybody. Oh, I just got one more. <laughs> what kind of watering system does Caltrans use? I have no idea. I don't know if you know. <laughs> uh, well, they use rotors more, more often than not. They use just big water cannon type rotors. Um, but they probably use everything, all the all the th tools available to them. And it's Great. in metric. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And like I said, an email will be coming out shortly with a survey and all of the links. So thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.